I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for November 21, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Lindsay Lark of Dumbarton Middle School. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to consider the agenda. Uh, Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. The agenda as prepared is be the agenda from which we will work. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this <coughs> evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in uh, the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight uh, during the public comment portion of the meeting. Ms. Schaefer. Susan Truesdell. Katie Schmidt. Nylea Johnson. Glenn Gelhar. <coughs> Kathy Wolfson. Jeff Supic, Lily Rowe, Hope Bear, Nevea Johnson, Sheila Ruth. Next on our agenda is a special order of business, recognition of uh, student artwork, and I invite Mrs. White to join me up front. Board of Education publishes the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, the CAFR or CAFR. Each year, student artwork is included in the CAFR. Uh, the uh, fiscal year 2017 CAFR includes the work of secondary school students, and these students are recognized at a board meeting when the CAFR is presented to the board. Each participating student receives a gift card to Barnes and Noble Bookstore. The following students' artwork was selected. Juwan Agri Smith from Owings Mills High School. Come forward. <laughs> Elissa Baylor from Delaney High School. Come forward. <laughs> Chris.
Kristen Doster from Dundalk High School. <laughs> Batting a thousand so far. Mm -hmm. Nico Galsam from Ridge Ruxton School. Congratulations, Nico. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Carmen Honeywell from Hereford High School. Christiane Iris Maga from Oberly High School. Yeah. <laughs> and Lydia Park from Catonsville High School. Lydia? Very good, thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns uh, to the superintendent and her staff. While we encourage public comment on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, it's not the proper forum to address specific employee or student matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution uh, processes as appropriate. Um, I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that the time has expired. I do want to first recognize uh, some elected officials who are here this evening and I uh, and the rest of the board are always pleased that our elected officials are uh, interested in our Baltimore County Public Schools and take the time to uh, join us here. I saw Delegate Ebersol. Delegate Ebersol, welcome. And Delegate Brooks. Delegate Brooks. And we have uh, two county councilmen, Count County Council Chairman Tom Quirk and Councilman, <laughs> Councilman Julian Jones. I'd like, uh, I know that both of them want to speak briefly, so Councilman Quirk, do you want to come forward? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Great to be here, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is uh, Tom Quirk. I'm the County Councilman for Southwest Baltimore County. I'm the chairman of the county council and also chair of the spending affordability committee. My other job is I sit as a certified financial planner and own and run a an retirement and investment company. Proud to say we have clients in 19 states. Um, I'm speaking here today in support of the $60 million substantial renovation to Lansdowne High School. As you know, both Nick Stewart and I both strongly rejected the $30 million initial plan as simply inadequate. After re re reviewing the preliminary design for the latest lands on high school renovation and speaking directly with the experts at Reuben and Associates and several other engineering firms, I'm much more confident and reassured the 60 million total investment will go much farther in obtaining the very best we can for Lansdowne. 
Contrary to what a few elected officials have said, Lansdowne is not being ignored. That's actually the farthest thing from the truth, and facts do matter. Between the new Lansdowne Elementary for 40 million and the substantial renovation of the high school for 60 million, Lansdowne is receiving over $100 million in school investment. The southern part of my district is receiving close to $153 million in investment of the total $317 million we're investing in southwest Baltimore County. Uh, there's been a lot of misunderstanding and, mi and misinformation in the community, and especially in regard to capital and funding, and I thought I'd present some information and perspective for the record. I'll try to be brief. Consolidated public improvements. Over the past 11 years, our entire consolidated public improvement budget for Baltimore County has averaged $230 million. Of this $230 million per year, we've averaged about $108 million for schools, or about 47% of the total consolidated public improvement budget. Think about this. In the entire fiscal year, we spent around $108 million for our total school system, which includes 157 schools and 16 special programs and centers. Building a brand new high school anywhere costs around $120 million. It would can consume the average capital budget for the whole school system for an entire year. Estimated fund balance, or basically what's called a surplus. Baltimore County has an estimated fund balance of 205 million. We need to keep 100 million of this balance for a rainy day, even when it's not raining. We can't even use it when it's raining. So this leaves us with about $105 million in what's called available balance. To the average person, um, you know, this might seem like a lot of money, and I can understand that. I can understand the 105 million might seem like a lot of money, but what I can assure everyone in this room, our credit rating firms, Moody, Standard Poor's, and Fitch, would like Baltimore County to increase our over, overall surplus balance and definitely not decrease it. As a matter of fact, recently a few bond analysts expressed concern it was too low. One change in federal or state funding levels, one bad recession, or a few bad outcome lawsuits, this could easily wipe out our available balance. Keep in mind for perspective also that our general fund budget is almost $2 billion and our overall government-wide operating budget is almost $3.5 billion. So $105 million isn't really a lot of wiggle room if anything goes wrong. And, and I'll conclude. Forward funding, and this is, this is really important. Um, early next year, it's important to stress that Baltimore County will have forward funded the state of Maryland over $230 million. These are dollars that we expect to recover from the state toward our school infrastructure cost. Currently, the state gives between 40 million and 50 million toward our school costs per year. At current rate, we will most likely recover the state funds within four and a half to five years. This forward funding is before any new high school is built anywhere. The state could help the county a lot by fast forwarding this forward funding if they chose. When you look at total cost, the county puts in 65 cents and the state puts in 35 cents of each dollar invested in our schools. Perhaps this, the state could consider matching 50 cents on every dollar that we invest. None of these considerations are easy, of course, and I surely don't suggest any of the solutions are simple. And the last thing I wanted to mention to the school board, because I think this is really important, is our debt, our county debt, is approaching capacity. Early next year, Baltimore County will issue $250 million of consolidated public improvement. Our debt service levels, I mean, our, our debt is increasing um, to a point that will exceed our debt service ceiling in a few short years, all observing school improvements currently in process. So very difficult and challenging decisions will be, de me will be needed to be made by the next county executive and county council. How do we continue to fund school improvements? How do we increase revenues to offset these costs? Do we scale back capital projects? Do we ignore it and have our triple, triple A bond rating suffer and wind up paying more in debt service cost? If anyone says we can build any new high school anywhere, my question is how and when and at what cost? What are the trade-offs? How do we absorb? This is precisely why I'm supporting substantial renovation at Lansdowne High School. I fear and worry that a rejection of this renovation will lead to substantial delay for Lansdowne. I know our bond capacity is exceptionally constrained. I'm advocating for what I think is the very best solution for my community. And what am I not doing? I'm not playing politics. I'm not grandstanding. I'm not making irresponsible, misinformed political statements using our kids as footballs in a high-level high level political match. I can assure you that Lansdowne is not being ignored. I want the very best for Lansdowne in my entire area that I represent. I also know how to read and understand capital budgets. And I wanted to thank you all for your consideration. I ask you to approve the substantial renovation at Lansdowne High School 
and we can simply, we cannot allow, allow our kids at Lansdowne to wait any longer and to be pushed back to the end of the line. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones. <laughs> So I don't want to say that Councilman Quirk used up all your time, but. <laughs> when it comes to dollars, trust me, Councilman Quirk knows. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, I'm Councilman Julian Jones, and I guess wanted to uh, come here this evening and tell you what's on my mind. First of all, I'd like to take a couple of seconds and thank you all for your service. We certainly appreciate everything you do for the students of Baltimore County as well as Baltimore County as a whole. Today I uh, was thinking about a quote, which is why I'm here. Uh, Martin Luther King once said that at the end of the day, you don't remember the words of your enemies. You remember the silence of your friends. So. Being a friend of the Baltimore County Public Schools and having a commitment to do what I can to ensure that our kids receive the very best education and the best resources possible, I find it necessary to come here today to urge you to call a vote and appoint Ms. Verlita White as the permanent superintendent of Baltimore County Schools and not spend 100000 or more on a search. And the reason I say that is not because I do not think that Ms. Verlita White would uh, not fare well uh, against anyone that this country could produce. The fact of the matter is, is when I look at someone such as Ms. Verlita White, I think it would be hard pressed for us to find anyone with her experience and knowledge and dedication to the Baltimore County Public Schools. The fact of the matter is Ms. White spent 12 years or 13 years as a student in our schools, attending Woodmore, elementary, Woodlawn High School, and graduating. And then to come back and work for the system for 25 years in various positions throughout the structure of the Baltimore County Public Schools, starting as a teacher, becoming a principal, an administrator, and working her way up to the interim superintendent. This type of experience is very, very difficult to somehow quantify. But it is there, it is necessary, and it would put her in a class far above anyone a national search can produce. Furthermore, when we're talking about the cost, 100000 maybe 200000 maybe that's not a lot of money in the big scheme of things in terms of the $1.8 billion that we give to the school system. But clearly, $100,000 can make a difference. There are projects that people in my community the schools would like to have that we don't have the money to fund. And this money can be better spent by uh, using that money for the students and not necessarily for a national search. Now, the elephant in the room, some people would say, well, what about that $3,000? Well, what I'm here to tell you is this. I would stack up Ms. Verlita White's integrity and her 25 plus years of experience against a typo or a mistake any day of the week. And for people to somehow try to make it more than it is, shame on you, shame on them. So in closing, I thank you very much for your time. I would urge you again to uh, look at this from a logical standpoint of view, which is you have a person in Ms. Verlita White already. So the question should be, let's have a vote and decide whether or not she has the confidence of the board. And if she has the confidence of the board, so be it. There's no need for a search. If she does not get the vote and there is no confidence, then by all means go ahead with the search. But I'm pretty sure that weighing all the facts, you will see, just as I have seen, that she is an excellent choice for our school. She is an excellent example for our children and she is just a Baltimore County gem. She is one of our own and we should support her. Thank you very much for your time and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I now call our advisory groups to speak, uh, and the first uh, is Tabco's representative, Abby Baton. I'm sorry to say, Council, I mean, Delegate Brooks would like to speak. Oh, so Ms. Baton, if you'll just hold off one second. <laughs> Delegate Brooks, sorry about that. I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, the, count, the two councilmen have used up all of your time. Oh, they, they have. I'll, I'll make sure I'm very, very short. <laughs> Okay, uh, Chairman Gillis, uh, good evening, and members of the board. I uh, just want to say a few things, and, I, and actually I wrote a letter and I submitted to, to all of you. Uh, uh, dear uh, uh, Mr. Gillis, as a resident of Baltimore County for 39 years and a business owner for 37, and as a member of the Maryland General Assembly, I strongly support and encourage the appointment of our interim superintendent, Mrs. Valida White, uh, to the permanent position. Uh, as you know, Mrs. White is, is from Baltimore County. She attended Woodmore Elementary, Woodlawn Middle, and graduated from Woodlawn High School. She also completed her post-secondary education in Maryland with a BS from Towson University, an MA from Notre Dame, and a doctorate candidate at Morgan State University. This track record validates her commitment to education in Maryland in general and Baltimore County in particular. Mrs. White is also a stakeholder in the school system due to the fact that her children attend Baltimore County schools. Yeah. It is my belief uh, spending between $100,000 and $200,000 to do a national search during our current budgetary constraints is ill-conceived and ill-advised, you know, especially when we have a candidate who is homegrown and has matriculated through our educational system. This mistake, <clears throat> this makes her uniquely qualified to understand the nuances as it relates to Baltimore County Schools. In reference to the financial disclosure issue, she has admitted to the oversight and has taken the necessary steps toward correction. Do we allow one mistake to invalidate all of the positive contributions she has made to Baltimore County Schools? Mrs. White has the best interests of all of our children in mind. It is imperative that we not deviate from helping our students advance to all levels. Her contingent leadership will in, ensure continuity and stability in a progressive Baltimore County school system. Uh, thank you for your consideration regarding this matter. And with kindest cigar, regards, I'm Delegate Ben Brooks, and, and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Delegate. <laughs> Now I think it's Abby Baton's turn. All right, Ms. Baton, it's your turn. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. I brought several teachers and support staff here with me tonight specifically to address the discipline issues facing us in our schools. Let me make it perfectly clear, we don't condone a zero tolerance policy. It doesn't work and it hurts students. We also don't believe the board policy surrounding discipline is the problem. Changing it will offer little or no relief. In schools that have collaboratively formulated a discipline plan, which is being followed by all with fidelity, these issues have been kept at a minimum. At issue is the fact that it is not happening in all of our schools. In some schools, the plan is in place, but the administration is not following that plan. Several of the teachers here tonight are from one of those schools. They have had a plan in place with two different principals, and yet when calls for help have gone unheeded, people got hurt. They have had five adults hurt this year alone, including one who is still out with a concussion. The special education teacher I told you about before was so traumatized by having her hand purposely broken by a student, she has decided to retire as of December 1st. She was not planning on leaving teaching yet, but couldn't see herself remaining in the profession any longer. 
TABCO's discipline team met with the BCPS officials yesterday afternoon and worked on a way forward. We are pleased that we are working together on this issue, but we all understand it takes time. Restorative practices offer real promise, but if they are implemented in haste without the proper foundation, they too will fail. We need administrators held accountable for following school policies that have been mutually agreed upon. In schools where these policies have not been put in place, the administration needs to collaborate with the faculty councils to create effective plans we need to hold the administrators accountable. What do we want now? We need you to put more support professionals in place. For example, school counselors, psychologists, behavior specialists, education support professionals, special educators, and social workers, to name just a few. We also need smaller class sizes so teachers can meet the needs of all their students. We understand that suspensions are not the best answer. However, if a student who exhibits chronic misbehavior is not removed from the classroom, the other children in the class miss out on their educations. We need proper supports in place to make sure these inappropriate behaviors are addressed and students are given the opportunity to learn in an environment more suited to their needs. We should not have to worry about the safety of our staff or our students. You need to advocate for the resources to do our jobs. Our students, our staff, and our parents are relying on your voices, pushing the county and state to fund what is necessary for us to be able to do our job successfully. Your voices will make the difference. Without that support, we cannot expect real results. Our kids can't wait any longer, and neither can our staff. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Case. We'll give the TABCO representatives a moment to clear the aisle and then call up the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee representative, Alyssa Hartman. Ms. Hartman? No, Ms. Hartman? There you go. Ms. Hartman, pull up a chair. Either one. Wherever you want to be. Please. Good evening, members of the board, Chairman Gillis. Nice to see you guys again. It's been a long time. As a parent of a 17-year-old child with autism, I want certain things from our local schools. I want a solid academic foundation, job readiness skills, vocational training, and social skills. But as important as all that is, when I walk into my son's school during American Education Week, I realize that I'm actually looking for something bigger than all of that. I'm going to be looking for how he feels about being there. I want my son to feel a sense of belonging to his school community. I want him to feel known and cared about. I think all parents want that for their kids. I want him to feel like he's contributing to the life of the school in some way. So using my teacher, administrator, and parent lens, I walk into American Education Week looking for evidence of an inclusive climate. But climate can be hard to pin down. So what are the questions I ask as I look around and that you as leaders of our system can also be asking? How does a school convey whether it actually embraces all students <coughs> in an inclusive climate? As my child walks through the halls, does he greet any of the other children? Do they greet him? If he speaks to them, how do they respond? Are they kind? Do they ignore him? Is my child welcome at the homecoming dance, or would it just be easier on everyone if those strange kids weren't there? Who's the dance for, and how is this conveyed? Is it for the whole school, for mostly the athletes? How does the school convey to my child that if he's interested, and he was, that he's welcome to attend? 
does anybody let me know there's a dance coming up? Because he might not. I watched my son in three inclusive classrooms where both diploma and non-diploma bound students were being instructed. In a way, I saw some wonderful examples of differentiated instruction, really encouraging. Um, but one of my questions is, are students and teachers speaking to my child, or is he in an invisible bubble with his aid? Because I saw examples of both. How does the general education teacher communicate her comfort level with my child in her classroom? Does she call on him, address him directly? Does she ask for his help with passing out papers or other tasks? Does she encourage other children to interact with him in any way, encourage him to learn other kids' names? Does she fold him into what is happening in that classroom? If she puts him in a small group to complete an assignment, does she coach that group and help them interact or just cross her fingers and walk away? Does the school newspaper offer stories that feature all students? Is my child included in any of the school-wide drama, dance, or music productions? How would this invitation be conveyed at the high school level? So what? Why does it matter anyway? Just get in there, get your AP credits, get out. Kids learn to be kind and thoughtful members of the community, the school, or they don't. By the time they leave at 18, if they haven't learned, it's probably too late. I'm encouraged, but I'd like to see administrators get out there in front, ask the hard questions about your school's climate, Lead your staff and students by example to become the inclusive citizens they are all capable of being. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. That's Jane Lee. Didn't think I was going to get here with the traffic. Uh, you and just want to try to get, see how close you can get to Mr. Young. I see that. Um, no, I don't think he wants to talk to me right now. I embarrassed him last week. Uh, <laughs> I've been kind of outspoken of late, but tonight I'm, after speaking with my favorite teacher, my daughter, last night, I was reminded that I'm here to collaborate and work with the teachers and the administration of schools and the board. She hung up on me last night, but she did call back and tell me she still loved me, but did it sink in? something I don't understand where she gets her stubbornness from but I'm here to say thank you it is Thanksgiving and it is time for that thank you to the teachers who have molded helped shaped my children thank you to teachers like Sue Sullivan and her husband Dan who when we ran into him she was my children's kindergarten teacher we ran into them a month ago and they came running up to my kids to hug them and talk to them and give them advice still to Mr. Pauls, who was the middle school teacher who didn't even have my daughter as a student, but when she was going through her darkest hours when my husband was dying, would say to her, come in at lunch and I'll help you with your algebra because I know your concentration's down. To Gary Tiller, who was at Sudbrook, and, and what a loss to the system that he's in Hawaii, who called me after a month of school and said, wow, I've never met anybody who needs to be in the theater more than your child, but she has no stage presence. How would you feel if I taught her theater tech because she belongs in the theater? She's now a graduate of SUNY Purchase and she does do theater tech and she also does arts management. It would, if not for him, she would have stayed that mediocre student. To Ted Winner, who coached my older daughter because she was an athlete and told my younger daughter when she decided to leave the school for the arts and come mainstream, he told her, we just have to find something your sister didn't do because I know everybody's after you because they think you're great. One daughter's 5'10", the other's barely five feet. She pitched, he, he had a friend, teacher had a pitch. Well, she had 13 strikeouts in her first game as a pitcher and played varsity for four years at Pikesville. So I have to thank those teachers and I'm sure every parent feels the same, thank you. Thank you all as Thanksgiving, and thank you to the administrators. Thank you to Verlita White, who has agreed to meet with me, and not during her hours, but my hours, and is meeting me in the evening. So I thank you, because I know you're staying late just for me. And I just want you all to have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Spend it with your family, because I will come back and give you all the complaints next meeting. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Next is the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. That's Lila Marinbloom.
Good evening, Interim Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and the Walmer County Board of Education. I'm here to talk about the importance of the paraeducator in the schoolhouse. <clears throat> Preparing children to successfully meet the future and not be overwhelmed by it has always been the priority. There have been times in our past when this objective might have been blurred or denied to a segment of the population. But as our nation matured, we have steadily m been moving towards academic equality. I am sure it has never been the goal in Baltimore County to teach kids to bully or disrespect each other or adults in their physical or cyber vicinity. This is, however, happening in our schools. Too many students and inadequate adult supervision has resulted in unsupervised students being able to create more than just anonymous childish mischief. Create a culture of respect and team unity for students to see. Because paraeducators are usually considered just the classroom helper, our importance is often just overlooked. Our presence needs to be viewed as meaningful and important. We should be considered a vital part of the educational team charged with contributing to instructing the whole student. We should be attending and actively participating in all staff meetings. A hurry Tuesday morning recap does not help build camaraderie. We should also be sharing with after school chaperoning duties. We should not be the group chased out of the building by Kronos. Give us the ability to grow in our profession through updated and meaningful professional development. Paraeducators cannot offer academic support to students if we don't have access to the devices and curriculum. Without adequate access to devices and programs, we can only watch the students sit and wait for the instructor to come to them. When we cannot direct substitutes or serve as substitutes because lessons are locked away in the two a teacher's device, we cannot maintain order in the classroom nor provide any meaningful instruction. The power educator, in order to best support, uh, to be the best support to both students and teachers, needs ongoing professional development, access to technology, being used in the classroom, and adequate time to perform their duties without being rushed out of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council, and that's Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good evening. Um, this is the time of year that we give thanks to everybody, and I'd like to thank the board for their diligent work on uh, the groundbreaking of the new elementary school in the Northeast area yesterday. It was a great um, event. It is the first uh, school in the Perry Hall area in 25 years, and it's uh, 10 years since the uh, uh, last school was built in the Northeast area. Um, that's, that's it for the joyful stuff. Um, I just like to say that it's, it's um, unfortunate to see um, our former superintendent and the interim superintendent in the national news. Um, it's something that we really don't want to have on, on front pages on newspapers. Uh, having said that, I, I'd also like to just stop for a moment and question the, uh, the uh, uh, stat and one-to-one -one device um, program. Um, perhaps if we had perfect infrastructure and um, enough money, um, we wouldn't have to select that uh, above uh, inadequate and unsafe uh, buildings. We have buildings with a leaking roof. We have uh, reports of flooding, electrified fences on sports fields, um, overcrowded buildings, crumbling buildings. We have mold. We have uh, lead in water. We have dirty water. Um, we have even buildings sliding into a pool. Um, and there's still money for hobby projects like this, one-to-one um, -one devices, but not for building renewals, uh, replacements, and new buildings. Um, I don't understand these priorities. Maybe you do, but, but I just don't. Um, 
I, I don't understand why we opt for um, devices that cost $1,500 in total cost of ownerships uh, when cheaper option is available. Um, I went online and I punched in some likely numbers into an IDC analysis tool, um, which indicated a considerable savings for uh, BCPS uh, if they would have chosen a different route. I have that report printed out and I'll hand it over to you uh, for your review afterwards. Um, I just want to urge you all to uh, be smart about spending where you spend the money that, that is uh, allocated to BCPS. With that, I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and enjoy. Thank you. Next, the time for public comment, and our first public comment speaker is Susan Truesdell. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board members, Superintendent White. My name is Sue Truesdell, and this is my third year as principal of Ridgely Middle School. And I have to share a very special administrative moment with you. I was recently meeting with a teacher who joyously proclaimed, finally, we're reading novels in class, and students are making sense of and engaging in advanced reading, writing, listening, and speaking. These are the, the literacy skills our students will need to perform their jobs, run their households, act cautiously and kindly as citizens, and successfully conduct their personal lives. And this was a department chair in social studies. <clears throat> My response to this teacher was, thank you, Verlita White. Developing literacy skills is a priority at our school, as well as continuing the momentum of personalized learning environments for every student. We can't continue this work without the vision and guidance of Ms. White. Her tenure with BCPS has allowed her to closely examine the needs of our system from every angle. I have a print by writer Brian Andreas that hangs behind my office desk, and every time I read the verse, I'm reminded of our superintendent. He writes, when I die, I'm coming back as a tree with deep roots, and I'll wave my leaves at the children every morning on their way to school and whisper tree songs at night in their dreams. Trees with deep roots know about the things that children need. Verlita, thank you for the deep roots you have established with this community and for knowing about the things our children need. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Schmidt. Ms. Schmidt. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight I'll be speaking in support of the STAT initiative and in support of Ms. Verlita White. My name is Katie Schmidt, and I'm honored to currently hold the position of STAT teacher at Rogers Forge Elementary. Prior to taking on this role, I have uh, been a classroom teacher for 14 years. I've been a part of the STAT initiative since day one, when Rogers Forge Elementary became one of the first 10 lighthouse schools. This journey that our administration, staff, students, and parents have been on to pioneer new teaching and learning styles and the use of the new technology tools was not an easy one, but it was, without a doubt, worth it to end up where we are today. Our students are not only invested and engaged in their learning, but they're achieving and innovating in ways that we never thought possible. Students have gone from using BrainPop as a learning resource to creating their own BrainPop style videos to teach others. We've created a school maker space in which we house arts and craft supplies, recyclables, building materials, as well as 3D pens, strawbies, little bits, makey makeys, and so much more. Our third graders are flying drones to simulate real world experiences and then writing about it. Our students are writing code to control ozobots, spheros, and cubelets. This is all possible due to the STAT initiative's provision of the one-to-one -one devices, the essential role of the STAT teacher, and the leadership of our incredible administration. The one-to-one -one devices provide experiences for our students that can be customized and personalized to meet the needs of each learner in a meaningful manner. 
The STAT teacher is able to coach teachers and provide support to them as they utilize effective teaching strategies in a blended learning environment using a mix of traditional and digital learning tools. Working closely with the STAT teacher, a supportive and enthusiastic principal who empowers her teachers to think outside of the box in order to effectively engage students and enhance instructional strategies is necessary as well. Despite any negative feelings toward the actions of Dr. Dance, it's important to look past the politics in order to realize the amazing impact the STAT initiative has had on our students. Taking away funding from this initiative would be taking a monumental step backwards. Our students and teachers both have spent years now growing with and reflecting on all of the new learning initiatives that have come about as a result of the STAT initiative. Teachers have empowered students to take ownership of and to extend their learning by using the devices and the other tech tools to explore new and different information that can only be gleaned from these opportunities. We would also be doing a disservice to our students in not preparing them for the 21st century jobs that they will face in the future. We would be removing a competitive edge that is essential to their success in the future workforce that we are currently working so hard to give our students. I truly don't know what a teaching world would look like without the one-to-one -one devices and the support for the STAT initiative. Considering the diverse populations we are teaching within the county, there would be no way to effectively meet all the needs of the learners without the resources that our technology currently provides. The one-to-one -one devices provide equitable access for all students across Baltimore County Public Schools. Finally, I would be remiss not to advocate for our incredible interim superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nylea Johnson. <laughs> Nylea Johnson. <laughs> Nylea Johnson. <laughs> Leah Johnson and team. Please begin. Hi, my name is Ilya Johnson and I'm in third grade in Fort Garrison Elementary School. In class during American, American Allocation Week, my, my mom came to visit. We, we were working on writing our fables before we started working on writing and coloring in the storyboards, we had to read a fable from our book to our parents. I read The Daughters and the Hare. After we read the fable, we had to pick our characters and write out a beginning, middle, and end. My story had a polar bear and an arctic fox. When I was drawing, I wasn't sure how to draw a polar bear, so I used my device to look one up. Then I went back to, to writing my fable. In our groups, we were sharing ideas, sharing ideas and getting help from, my, from our teacher, Miss Spalding. I didn't finish early, but if I had, but if I had, I <coughs> could have worked on my gratitude journal or worked on iReady. I like having my device because even if we have a substitute, we still get to work on our regular work. Before, we just had big packets of work or we watched movies. Now, our substitute can dock our computer and she can see our student, the student drive. Hi, hi, Miss White. You've come to my school twice this year and it's only November. My class and I love seeing you. You make me smile and feel comfortable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Glenn Gielhar. Good evening. Um, uh, interim uh, 
Superintendent Verletta White, distinguished members of the Board of Education, thank you all for your service. Um, and I'm very thankful for Baltimore County Schools, um, a parent of five children. Uh, my two younger children, um, my son Justin has low functioning autism, currently attends school at Parkville High School in the CALES program, communication learning support. And my youngest daughter, Brianna, had been at risk and um, uh, she entered a program at Pinewood Elementary School. And oh boy, how I'd love to clone Pinewood in Parkville and Hiss Avenue. So, but that's a story for another day. But I'm here actually to talk about my older children. So I have three older kids, and all three of them attended uh, Lansdowne High School. And it is a very great school, too. Um, my son, Ryan, uh, he created a video promoting school lunch. And I understand they still play it sometimes during the morning announcements. Um, my daughter, Amanda, Mandy, we call her, um, she learned how to play the violin very well. And she helped teach my youngest daughter to play violin and she still plays at our local church. But for my oldest daughter, Brittany, um, who has severe mold allergies, when she attended Lansdowne, she was sick. She was sick every day that she went there. She was sick in the ninth grade, and then in the 10th grade, she dropped out because of her illnesses. Um, I can tell you that after school, her trips to St. Agnes Emergency Room for breathing treatments, her you know, week-long stays at Mount Washington Pediatric Center. And, um, you know, again, I'm sure that, that the, I'm confident as a parent that, that the mold in that building had a lot to do with her illnesses. Um, and while I uh, appreciate uh, Councilman Quirk, uh, he's a great advocate for the community. He's, he's a wonderful servant. And I understand why there may be some concern. Well, hey, if we don't take this renovation, maybe Lansdowne won't get anything. But my hope, uh, and my prayer is, is that Baltimore County finds a way to replace Lansdowne High School. I'd like to see uh, a new school built next to the existing school, kind of like what we did at Carver Tech in Towson. Build the school on the field, tear the school down, put in a new field. The renovation of the building does not change the fact that the building sits right next to the lake. The ventilation intake for the building is on the lake side of the building. I don't know that the school is being waterproofed. Uh, and what about the children with mold allergies like my daughter who went there during the renovation process when they're pulling out the ceiling tiles and stuff? A um, lot of positive things. The future is bright in Lansdowne. The new maglev possibly happening. The, the Amazon headquarters that we're trying to land at Port Covington, all near Lansdowne. It could have a real boom. We should look at adding capacity. I ask you to delay this. Our next speaker is Kathy Wolfson. Ms. Wolfson. Kathy Wolfson. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Kathy Wolfson. I'm president of the Greater Patapsco Community Association. We're located on the western part of the county, mostly in the rural area outside the Yertle, but um, our schools, um, local schools are Winfield and Hernwood Elementaries, Deer Park Middle, Windsor Mill Middle, Randallstown High School, and um, Woodlawn High School. And recently it's been said that we are an over 50 community. This is a community made of old farmhouses, um, open fields, you know, agricultural properties, high-end developments, very mixed. But we don't have people with children moving into our area anymore. Um, I'm pinning, and my association is pinning, our hopes on Verlita White. She's done an excellent job. She's, she's born in Baltimore County. She has been through the whole system, nobody, no candidate can know our area better than for Lita White and the needs of these schools. Um, I have to say I've been very disappointed in the performance of our schools throughout the um, superintendency of Bob Dubell, Anthony Marchione, um, Joe Harrison. We have not been supported with our student population has not been supported by the board or by previous superintendents. 
um, for LEAD, it brings a promise of literacy and discipline to schools. And we truly hope that you will support her and um, appoint her as superintendent. The West Side needs that expertise and to continue the momentum that she has built in her very brief tendon, uh, uh, very brief, um, um, yeah, <laughs> since she's been interim superintendent. So we hope you'll give her that consideration and invest in these students who are very capable but have not be, have been underserved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Our next speaker is Jeff Supik. Jeff Supik. I'd like to thank my councilman, Julian Jones, for his great presentation and his expressions of support for Relita White. I had the honor and privilege of meeting her just a few months ago while I was working on a back-to-school uh, book bag giveaway for another success story of Baltimore County, Kevin Lyles. I've listened to a lot of the history of the uh, character and the resume qualifications that she presents to the Baltimore County public school system and the population that we so strongly try to support. I came, got up this morning and said there is no way I'm going to remember all of the attributes and qualifications of this lady's resume, so I have to thank Julian Jones again for pointing out all of those qualifications. I wanted to mainly state that a lot of times at the end of meetings and hearings like this, I say to myself, why didn't someone ask this or why didn't someone look at it from this way? When I hear about Ms. Ms. White's uh, history, sure, there are some complaints from some parents because she's too hard in some ways, but she is a walking success story. She went through the entire school system and 25 years as an, in the educational system, so she knows what she's talking about. When she walks the halls and streets of Baltimore County schools, her heart's on the floor and the ground with the students. She knows what they're talking about. She, she has goals. And I'm here to support her as much as I can. The question that I would like to ask that no one else will, when they considered rewriting a contract for Mr. Dallas Dance, there was already in his history the question of unreported income. From what I understand, that's the only thing that the school board may be considering to disqualify Ms. White for any further consideration beyond next November. They knew about his problems before they wrote the contract again for him for another four years, in spite of the fact that they didn't go out for another search because $100,000 plus was too much to waste on somebody that they already knew. This lady has already shown us through experience what she does and knows for Baltimore County. And I strongly advise and encourage the school board and all of our population and parents to give her another four years beyond this year of inter interimship. You have my support as much as I can give you. You know where I am. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our next, our next speaker is Lily Rowe. Lily Rowe. I'd like to do a little bit of a history lesson and point a couple things out. Repeatedly, our county executive has come up with all kinds of reasons why when the people want to do something, there's no money. So portable air conditioning is mechanically impossible. Then we find out Anne Arundel County did it and it would have cost $10 million to put portable air conditioning in all of the schools that didn't have air conditioning at that time. Just $10 million. So what does he do? Forward funds $300 million to do central air conditioning faster in the schools which he said himself were the most difficult schools to air condition because he did the easiest to air condition first. Well, what does that mean? 
the schools that are falling apart that need to be replaced, he is putting central air conditioning in. And an HVAC system is one third of the cost of a facility, a new facility. Which means those schools that are getting that central AC, they're not getting new buildings whether they needed them or not. But that $300 million is now tied up in cash flow and can't be used for new high schools. But before he came up with $300 million out of an impossible situation, which we can only assume the heavens opened and dropped $3 million into his lap, because even back at that time, we had council members saying that it was impossible to fund everything or anything or, you know, poor talking is what my grandfather used to call it. You poor talk, so your neighbors give you donations. And the county executive poor talks so that the state he can beg money from. And the state's willing to give us the money if we just ask for it. So the county executive has said he will fund the planning for a Towson High School this year. I don't have a problem with that, except for the fact that there's a worse high school that needs a new building that's getting a Band-Aid renovation that will keep, you know, kids sit on the radiators in those classrooms now because the classrooms are so small, they can't even sit in a regular chair. And they're gonna take out the radiators, the classrooms are still gonna be small, and they couldn't even find 21st century furniture to sit in those rooms. And the furniture they found that would fit, your average full-grown male high school student, I would challenge you to even try to sit my 12-year-old son in one of those desks. So this is not gonna be a 21st century learning environment when we're done with it. The state has money, but there's a process to ask for that money in the county. But he simply refuses to ask for the money. So you tell me what's fair and just and what's fair and just to give Towson High School a new high school about the time Lansdowne's renovation is gonna open? Or you build Lansdowne first, and then Towson gets done next, and all the other schools after that with money that you make them buy, because it's there. Because the state has the money and they'll give it to you if you just ask for it. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Our next, <laughs> our next speaker is Hope Beyer. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Ms. White, and members of the board. My name is Dr. Hope Beyer, and I am the very proud principal of Fort Garrison Elementary School, Nylia Johnson's school, who, by the way, is a very tough act to follow, <laughs> but I, I will do my best. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide feedback to you, both as a principal and a parent. As a lighthouse school, our learning environment prepares students to be digital citizens that are globally pr competitive. The digital resources that are embedded into the curriculum allow for extension activities and raises the level of rigor for all students. On a daily basis as a principal, I observe students engaged in a challenging, blended learning environment. My students are able to extend their own learning, to work in collaborative groups, and have meaningful integration of technology. As a parent of four children, three of whom are proud BCPS graduates, I have one more who's a junior, I wish that my own children had had this type of transformational instruction in elementary school to prepare them to be 21st century citizens. Under Ms. White's leadership, BCPS will continue to make gains in preparing our students for future success. Berlita White has always maintained that the technology is not the focus, but rather a vehicle for instruction and our students. Ms. White's focus is on literacy, using technology to provide equitable access for all students. We must prepare our children to be literate in order to compete and thrive in our changing world. Ms. White's leadership style is one of a visionary, but she is also very approachable. <coughs> She genuinely cares about the success of all students and staff, and staff, which is evident in every school visit 
where she interacts with children and teachers, asking for their feedback and opinions. Ms. White is a steady, calm, and strong advocate that leads the way as a champion for our students. I am honored to be able to lead a school under her leadership. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nevaeh Johnson. Johnson. Hi, my name is Nevaeh Johnson, and I go to Pikesville High School. I attended Pikesville Middle School, which was a lighthouse school, and because I was in eighth grade last year, I didn't receive a device. I'm now realizing that I missed out on so many opportunities. I look back and see that my class was a little bit more misbehaved than the classes below us because we didn't have devices. Once I got to Pikesville High and received my device, I was introduced to all the resources that I could use in and outside of school. This has helped me transition to high school in an easier way. Ms. White, thank you for stepping up to be our superintendent. I can tell you care a lot about all of the children in Baltimore County. It's nice to have a strong black female role model. Thank you for all you do. And this is my friend, Kennedy Brummagen. She goes to George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology. She has two parents who work as teachers in Baltimore County and two sisters that attend Baltimore County high schools as well. Them and herself personally are for the devices in school. Although she doesn't have a device of her own, her school provides them fully charged in many of her classes. The devices help her with all her school projects, especially since she doesn't have her own computer, it's faster and easier. With the devices, she doesn't have to use the older computers, which take longer and have more chance, chances to cause problems. As you may know, Carver is a magnet school, and her prime, car, her prime at Carver is dance. Many may think that dance doesn't require any technology. However, at Carver, they do many research projects, learning about nutrition and writing correction papers. With the devices, they are able to go further in depth in research classes just at home, now in class. Thank you, Mrs. White, for everything you, you have done, and thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here and speak with you all. Thank you. And our last speaker this evening is Sheila Ruth. Ms. Ruth. Um, my name is Sheila Ruth. I'm the president of the Baltimore County Progressive Democrats Club. Um, I don't have a child in the Lansdowne area high schools. In fact, my child has grown. However, I am a 28-year resident of Baltimore County in the southwest area and a taxpayer. Um, I was also invited by some of the Lansdowne moms in my role as one of the leading activists in the county. Um, I'm concerned about the, the poor investment of a $60 billion of Sixty billion of my tax dollars um, in a renovation that will not address all the problems of the high school. The classes are already overcrowded, and the classroom size will not be increased in the renovation. Um, in fact, I, I would note that in the architectural renderings in the presentation, if you'll look, there are 12 students in one of them and 15 students in the other, which makes them look very spacious, when in fact there's likely to be double that in any classroom. Um, although the renovation will be technically ADA compliant, it will be a great inconvenience for people with disabilities who will have to navigate a labyrinth of elevators, ramps, and lifts. The ramps and the lifts will also narrow the hallways, creating bottlenecks for all students. Um, according to uh, March 2015 enrollment projections, the projected enrollment um, may exceed the capacity of the new school only a couple of years after the school is finished. Does that make sense to renovate a school um, and put that much money into it when it's going to possibly exceed the um, enrollment um, limits? Um, that doesn't even begin to get into the foundational issues, including groundwater seepage, misconstructed underground pipes, and possible 
additional shifting. The engineers are confident that they can fix the foundational problems, but do we really want to gamble $60 million on that? Um, and so uh, I think that $60 million is a poor investment on, on renovating um, the school. Uh, a new school uh, over the time will not be more expensive. The, the cost over uh, $60 million over 21 years, $2.86 million a year, $135 million over an expected lifetime of 50 years would be $2.7 million per year. That's according to state public school construction pro program standards. Um, I, uh, so I think $60 million is a poor investment for something that will not address the problems and a school that may be overcrowded. Councilman Quirk is right that there are no easy answers, but I think we need to take a step back and ask, is this really a good investment of money? And is this really the best thing for our children? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next on our agenda is item G, personnel matters. And for that, I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. board consent for the following personnel matters termination retirements and resignations so I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits g1 through g3 so moved. is there a second second any discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. Uh, opposed the motion carries thank you thank you dr. Mayo uh, next on our agenda is item H, action taken in closed session, and for that I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered uh, three appeals regarding confidential student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. All three were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken uh, in closed session in those matters, which were um, hearing examiner numbers 1802, 1809, and 1823. Do I have a motion to approve uh, the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mr. Gillis, there's one matter where I'm um, not with the majority. All right. Um, uh, then we'll do them one at a time. First one. Um, 18 1802. 1802. All in favor of 1802. Please say aye. 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 That motion carries. I'm abstaining on all of them. All right. It's, the record will reflect that Mrs. Miller is abstaining on all of them. And then next one, Mr. Nussbaum. 1809. All in favor of the uh, motion to approve the action taken in closed session on 1809, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Mrs. Miller abstains. 1823. And that one passes. And now 1823. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And Mrs. Miller abstains. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the orders are on the table for signature. Thank you. Very good. Next on our agenda is uh, item I, and it is a fiscal year 2017 <laughs> comprehensive <coughs> annual financial report and single audit. Uh, the comprehensive annual financial report and single audit is prepared annually in compliance with the public school laws of the state of Maryland. All funds and accounts of the board are included in the CAFR. While the board is entitled, uh, is, is an entity created and governed by, by state law, it has been defined as a component unit of the Baltimore County government for financial reporting purposes. The financial statements for fiscal year 2017 have been audited by Clifton Larson Allen. In accordance with state law, the independent auditor's report is included in the financial section of the CAFR. As required as a condition of receipt of federal funds, Clifton A Larson Allen also conducts an annual audit of federal funds. The fiscal year 2017 single audit of federal funds is also provided. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board. I'm George Saris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services, and with me tonight are Sherry King and Bill Early of Clifton Larson Allen. 
Uh, Sherry is the director uh, who uh, managed our audit. Bill is a principal with the firm. And over the last month, uh, we have presented and discussed the uh, annual financial report and the single audit uh, with the audit committee. And they have a brief presentation tonight that will summarize the scope of their work, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we heard it present the 2017 financial statements. Um, we provided two services for the Board of Education. The first was uh, the financial audit of the comprehensive annual financial report. This was audited in accordance with government auditing standards. <coughs> Um, we also did the audit of uh, the single audit, which is your audit of uh, federal grant expenditures. Um, this also includes um, certification of the data collection form um, with the federal government as well. We issued four reports. Um, the first two reports were related to the comprehensive annual financial report. That includes the independent auditor's report and the report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters based on an audit of financial statements performed in accordance with government auditing standards. Uh, then we also issued, related to the single audit, the uh, independent auditor's report on compliance with each major federal program, report on internal control <coughs> over compliance, and report on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards required by the uniform guidance. And then we also issued a letter to uh, those charged with governance, which would be to the Board of Education. Um, in terms of the results of our procedures, uh, we did perform an audit of the financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting standards. The purpose of our audit is to provide reasonable but not absolute assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. I say uh, reasonable, not absolute, because we do have a materiality associated with our audit. Uh, we don't audit every single dollar within the statements. We do have materiality threshold. We did access the, uh, access the counting principles used and significant estimates used by management within those statements, and then also evaluated the overall presentation of the financial statements. In terms of the internal auditor's opinion, which is within the comprehensive annual financial report, we issued an unmodified opinion. That's a clean opinion. That's the highest level of assurance that we can provide um, on your financial statements. And this is a consistent with prior years. It's the same opinion you've received for the past number of years. So which is a very good opinion. Um, in terms of the internal audit report on independent control, on an internal control, excuse me, there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies um, that we noted um, within the board. Um, just a note, we did not issue a management letter this year because we did not have any management letter comments to include in a management letter. So we didn't issue a separate management letter or report. Uh, in terms of the single audit, um, Baltimore schools, it's considered a low risk auditee, which means that we are required to audit 20% of your federal expenditures. This year, uh, we audited Title I was our major program, which represented, represented approximately 30% of your federal expenditure. So we audited a little bit more than what was required. We did have one very minor finding um, related to the single audit that was related to um, reporting to MSDE of the total non-public cost of, and funds of providing equitable service under Title I. This was a, a very minor reporting finding. I just wanted to note that you were in compliance with all the requirements under Title I. You just reported an incorrect number to the state, unfortunately. So we just recommended that the, um, the system just tighten their controls a little bit over just uh, the review of any reports submitted to oversight agencies. But as I just want to repeat, you are in compliance with all requirements under the Title I program. Um, we made certain communications to the audit committee that we'll also make to you tonight. Um, the scope and timing you know, of the audit proceeded as planned. Your comprehensive annual financial report was due to the state on September 30th, and we did meet that deadline as required. Your single audit is due um, to the state by December 31st, um, and that has already been issued, so we are well ahead of that deadline as well to tonight. Um, significant accounting policies are um, described in note one of the comprehensive annual financial report. Um, they are consistent with prior year. If you were to compare this year's statements to last year, we review those to make sure they are consistent with industry practices and standards. Also want to note that there were no new um, accounting standards that we implemented this year. There was nothing applicable for the school system. Um, so it was pretty much a status quo year per se, as far as accounting standards are concerned. 
There are four significant accounting estimates within your financial statements um, that we look at. Those include the depreciation for useful lives of uh, fixed assets. Um, we make sure that those useful lives are consistent with industry standards and um, asset categories. And then also three actuarial evaluation, um, well, three estimates related to actuarial evaluations. Those are your pension liability, your other post-employment um, liability, and your incurred but not reported uh, claims related to your self-insurance uh, workers' compensation. And we review those outside um, reports from those specialists and make sure the assumptions and everything that went into them is reasonable compared to standards. We do not have any uncorrected or corrected adjustments, no difficulties encountered during um, the audit, no disagreements with management, no issues discussed prior to our selection engagement as the independent auditors, and management indicated that they did not consult with any other accountants um, regarding the application of accounting standards. Uh, just to give you a general overview of our audit approach, we begin our audit roughly around the springtime, around April. We come in and, and go through our gain, our understanding of the, um, the school system, update our understanding of your certificate and processes and controls, uh, do a risk assessment and planning. We do have a risk-based audit approach and assess your internal controls. We do test internal controls over some significant areas such as your payroll expenditures, your non-payroll expenditures, capital expenditures, those areas. Um, we do then come back around the August time frame after management's had time to close out the books at June 30th uh, to do our substantive testing of the year-end balances related to the comprehensive annual financial report and then also to um, uh, audit the actual CAFR itself and to make sure um, it's in accordance with all the accounting, accounting standards and government auditing standards. Uh, we did have a couple high-risk areas, which is uh, pretty status quo, uh, revenue recognition, payables, accruals, and other liabilities, payroll expenditures, which include pension and OPEB because they are significant estimates within your financial statements, non-payroll expenditures. We do take a look at your information technology system and the control environment around that system, uh, grant compliance and financial statement disclosures as well. And I just want to um, just briefly bring your attention to the management discussion analysis, which is on page 24 to 40 of the CAFR. This provides a very high level um, overview of the financial numbers within the statement. It gives you a comparison of year to year information. Um, so that way, if you know you were looking just for more a high, the highlight, so to speak, of what happened for the year from a financial perspective, this would be a good 15-page you know synopsis for you to look over. Um, it's a very large document, so I would recommend that maybe the 15 pages in the MDNA would be worth um, perusing when you, if you have a moment. So. Uh, and the other thing that I'll just mention tonight is we do have one accounting standard that is going to be new for next year, and that is going to be GASB 75 related to other post-employment benefits. Um, this will be um, requiring you to include um, a liability for the, um, the benefit that you will have to pay out in the future for OPEB. This is similar to the pension um, liability that was placed on the statements a couple years ago related to GASB 68. So we will have a significant liability um, that will be on the books starting next year. Um, you are part of the county's OPEB trust plan, so we'll be working with the county to coordinate what all um, will go into that as far as the school system in the county. Thank you. Are there questions of either Mr. Saris or of our independent auditors? Mr. Sturt. With respect to the OPEB, li with respect to the OPEB liability, um, given that this is kind of a, a new event for us to try to track and monitor over time, do you have a sense of how that coordination process is going to go? I mean, that's certainly not an easy uh, challenge as it relates just to the county, and now that we're kind of uh, trying to combine resources as it relates to it. It might be a complicated and difficult process. It will be an actuarial evaluation that the county is working on right now. Okay. Um, so they'll, they spearhead all of that on your behalf because they do oversee that. So, um, so you mostly get most of the information from the county. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Sears. And I thank our independent auditors from, oh, wait a minute. Mrs. Causey has a question. Um, I was looking through the um, reports that you have given to us, so I'm curious in your audit, do you ever go through the financial um, ethical disclosure forms that the board members and uh, employees are required to submit? 
We do um, look at a sample of the disclosures to make sure that um, the required employees are submitting them and submitting them timely. Um, that's what we look at required, related to those disclosures. We don't look at them for completeness. Um, we look at them just to make sure that they're submitted timely in accordance to your policy and the required people are submitting them. So do you look at, re do you look at reports from the ethics review panel as to the number of employees that have completed them on time or you actually look at the physical document? We pull a sample. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Now we thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is item J, a uh, report on the Board of Education Policies, and for that I invite Mr. Virch to proceed. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the Board accept this report of the Committee's approved proposed amendments to the following Board policies. 8130, Internal Board Policies, Organization Policy Formulation. 8222, Internal Board Policies, Duties and Responsibilities, Superintendent, Executive Officer, Secretary and Treasurer. 8230, Internal Board Policies, Duties and Responsibilities, Orientation of New Board Members. 8250, Internal Board Policies, Duties and Responsibilities, Board Members' Responsibilities. 8270, Internal Board Policies, Duties and Responsibilities, Board Committees. 8280, Internal Board Policies, Duties and Responsibilities, Memberships. 8311, Internal Board Policies, Operations, Meetings. 8320, Internal Board Policies, Operations, Final Action by the Board. And the proposed deletion of Policy 8312, Internal Board Policies, Operations, Public Meetings. These proposed amended policies are presented to you on tonight's Board Agenda as Exhibit J. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved. Second? Oh, no second is needed. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Next on our agenda is item K, a report on the proposed boundary for Lansdowne Elementary School. And for that, I believe Dr. Martin Knox and Dr. Brown are coming forward. So good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. This evening, I bring forward to you the Lansdowne Elementary Community Boundary Study recommendation. Seated with me this evening is Dr. Russ Brown, our Chief Accountability Officer. So we'll begin with the first slide about the boundary change process. There are four phases of the boundary change process, with the planning beginning the first step that began in April and concluded in August of 2017. Within the planning phases, the superintendent initiated the boundary study process to begin for the Lansdowne Elementary community, as well as an orientation being held for our principals and communication with our community regarding this process. Our principals also initiated the process of electing or selecting participants to serve on the community uh, boundary committee. During this time, we also prepared staff data um, and information, and then after all that information was gathered, a committee was convened. The boundary study began in September of 2017 and concluded in November of 2017. This evening, we will present the recommendation from that committee, and then we will return for a final decision regarding the recommendation. The new boundary will be implemented in January 2018, with your approval, and between August 2018. The boundary change process, I'm sorry, excuse me, can you click while I talk? <laughs> Trying to click and talk was confusing me, so I apologize. <laughs> Just try adding chewing gum. Jeez. Just never thought I'd be able to sit here and say I can't multitask, but I can, so that was just very challenging for me. 
So our participating schools included Baltimore Highlands Elementary School, Lansdowne Elementary School, as well as Riverview Elementary School. There are other schools in the area, but they were not included as a part of this study as they've already had a boundary uh, study and began implementation in August of 2017, and that included Halethorpe Elementary as well as Relay Elementary School. The boundary change process included the following. As a result, these are the factors that were the driving force behind the recommendation for the boundary study. First, the reconstruction or expansion of Lansdowne Elementary School, which is slated to open for the 2018-19 school year. At this time, Lansdowne Elementary is at a capacity of 313 students enrolled for a target in the new facility of 709 students. At this time, Lansdowne Elementary School as well as Baltimore Highlands Elementary School are considered overcrowded. Lansdowne Elementary is at a capacity of 156 percent, while Baltimore Highlands is overcrowded or over capacity at 123 percent. This is effective, um, or this data is effective for September 30th's count or enrollment. The objectives of the boundary study um, include the following in accordance to policy in Rule 1280 to reduce overcrowding in the Lansdowne community, as well as creating a viable, successful boundary to effectively utilize the added capacity for Lansdowne Elementary School, as well as the other schools that were included in the study. We also look to, again, in accordance to policy in Rule 1280, look to support diversity among the schools that reflects the community and the school system. Governed by policy and rule 1280, there's additional information that also needs to be taken into consideration for the boundary study. First, the use of the geographic features, such as railroads, creeks, and major highways within the community, as well as the ability to accommodate the expansion of programs, such as early childhood, special education, and additional programs. The boundary committee was comprised of 12 members. Three of the members were principals, and as I stated earlier, the principals also selected parents and teachers to participate on the committee. The principals were active participants, but they were not permitted to vote on the recommendation in moving forward. And the committee was also comprised of nine teachers, as well as parents who worked with the community um, to make the decision and the recommendation. During the process, the committee was also supported by the community superintendent, the executive director, and we had additional staff there to support and facilitate the process. We were also joined during our meetings with support from our specialists in the offices to ensure that there was collaborative participation. The committee met four times between September 2017 and November 2017, and I must add that the committee spent countless hours working in between meetings as well, reviewing the information. The, reviewed, the committee reviewed and agreed upon neighborhood planning blocks to support the study. During the discussions, we created, discussed, and reviewed multiple options that were presented and discussed. We also use several resources, such as the BCPS website, our email, and interactive maps to review operations, um, to review options, and to collaborate between meetings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's always my pleasure to play Vanna, and I, I can continue, I think. I, I'm not trying to do two devices at one time, so I, I think we, we're, we're good. Uh, when the boundary study started, um, Letters were sent out to uh, families in June of uh, 2017 regarding the boundary change process, and it was followed up by a variety of communications to the community uh, as a whole, including newsletters, uh, phone calls, flyers, and, and other outreach. Uh, public were invited to attend all the committee meetings uh, as observers, and we had some folks who would come and watch. And all meetings uh, were live streamed, uh, as we've had in past practice. Um, all information uh, connected to the boundary process is available, um, was provided to uh, the committee and is also available on the BCPS website from each me meeting throughout the process. In terms of public pr participation and input, um, public, were, again, were invited uh, to provide input throughout the process uh, via email and through the BCPS website. And we've received a number of emails over time. And again, those were shared with the committee throughout the process. 
Uh, the, public, uh, the committee had a public information session uh, with approximately 30 attendees. Uh, this was a smaller boundary. It didn't garner quite as much attention as some of our other boundary processes have over time. Um, but following that, we also opened a uh, survey to, to the public, uh, much as we've done in, in other cases. And we had 196 total respondents to that. that. That survey was offered in English, Burmese, and Spanish. We did have 30 respondents in Spanish. And I'm very thankful uh, to the principals and uh, support staff who reached out to ensure that we uh, had participation in the survey and engagement at the building level, something I think Dr. Martin Knox will speak to again later. So uh, the committee, as it went through this process, despite it only being three buildings and a relatively confined uh, boundary process, they did uh, come up with 10 different uh, boundary options that they considered during that process. They uh, thoughtfully reviewed those and discussed um, all those materials, the emails, uh, the input from the public in general. Um, and they, in that process, as with all boundaries, uh, they come to the conclusion that um, not all the considerations can be equally met by any one of the, the boundary options. There's always compromise one way or another as you go through this. So uh, despite having 10, they whittled that down to four, and those four are what they took to the public information session to gather uh, input from the public and also to get that uh, during, again, the survey back from the public. At following that uh, public information session, uh, they gathered that input, they, they reflected on uh, all that information, and the final options that they considered were the options that they took to the community. There were no significant changes that came out of that uh, public information session or from, from the survey at that point. Uh, it was actually fairly clear from, from the, the public information in the survey um, that there was a favored option from the public in this. Options A and D uh, were considered and they're, they're presented on the following slides. You will see some patterns here, one of which is that in this, all the movement is between Baltimore Highlands and Lansdowne. Riverview is constant throughout this. Uh, the committee fairly quickly came to realize that the overcrowding that they were trying to, uh, to address was primarily for Baltimore Highlands with the new capacity at the new Lansdowne Elementary School. And you'll see that, that it's a small number of planning blocks that are being moved in each case. So in option A, there are three planning blocks that are moved. Option B adds one planning block. And those two options are sort of similar. Options C and D were a little bit different. They focused mainly in, a, in an area of apartment buildings uh, along the, the Lansdowne, uh, Riverview, Baltimore Highlands boundary. Uh, option C had a couple planning blocks in it. Option D extended a little further down into that apartment complex. In the end, uh, the committee considered all that input, uh, developed through that process, and unanimously voted for option A. We had seven of nine voting members uh, present for that meeting, and all seven opted for option A in this case, which was also very consistent, again, with the feedback that we received from the community as a whole. So option A has some, some things that I, I think um, became evident uh, for why they support it. One, uh, it does uh, a nice job of balancing the enrollment between Lansdowne and um, allows for some projected increase in the enrollment at that school. We have seen in the past where new schools sometimes have a new school effect. Uh, it has the least number of impacted students, so it has the smallest footprint on the community in terms of changes. And it has the least number uh, of students being impacted in terms of walking. Um, and again, there was community support for option A. So option A, again, involves just moving three planning blocks that are currently within Baltimore Highlands into Lansdowne Elementary School. <coughs> so as mentioned earlier, um, at this point, we're sitting at 156% uh, over capacity at, at Lansdowne, and we're significantly over capacity at Baltimore Highlands. If you uh, look at the option A results, you see that option A uh, brings Baltimore Highlands under 100% and leaves the new lands down under 100% as well. If we look at demographics, what you will see is across the, um, all the demographic uh, attributes that we look at, 
um, that is, you know, composition of the building based on race, composition of the building based on farm status, language status, that um, these options, option A essentially maintains the status quo. The buildings, um, the level of diversity between the buildings remains relatively stable across these options. So we see that option A has an impact on 138 students and uh, takes 121 students who currently can walk and, and requires them to ride a bus. This is an unavoidable option uh, in this case. Any movement between these buildings was going to require that some students who currently walk would end up having to ride a bus. In talking with our transportation team, they anticipate that that would be two new routes uh, for the system uh, with about a 20 minute ride time. And so the next steps, the Board of Education will host a public hearing on Wednesday, December 6th, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. at Lansdowne High School in the auditorium. And the Board of Education meeting will be held on December 19th where we will bring the uh, information back for a final decision regarding the Lansdowne um, boundary study. So this evening, I'd also like to take the opportunity to really thank our principals for their work throughout this process. Our principals worked very diligently to make sure that we had the voice of all of our community um, to the point where they opened the schools in the evening and set up sites where parents could come in and engage in conversation as well as including interpreters so that we left we did not leave any voice out of this process. So joining us here this evening, we have two of our three principals. First, Ms. Maddox could not be here for a previous engagement, but I'd like to publicly thank her for her leadership. And we also have with us Mr. Brian Williams, the principal from Baltimore Highlands, as well as Mr. Stephen Price, the principal from Lansdowne Elementary School. So at this time, if the board has any questions, um, we're here to help Great. you navigate through Thank you, through Dr. Those. Martin Knox. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Are there questions? Uh, just Let's one question. Um, is construction one time? You expect to open in August of 18? Mr. Dixit. Okay. I'm glad we're on schedule. You. Okay. Anything else? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown, for discussing the transportation impacts. Um, is that somewhere in this report that I missed, or is that um, not? It's not in the report right now. Okay. So would you mind repeating that then, please? <coughs> we anticipate uh, that uh, from the Transportation Department, we anticipate this would create two new routes with an approximate ride time of 20 minutes. So is the ride time 20 minutes in each direction or averaged over? That I can't answer off the top of my head. Okay. Maybe if you could check with uh, Mr. McRae and um, if the superintendent wouldn't mind including that in the weekly update, that would be helpful. It, I will say that it's a very tight-knit community and it's not a lot of distance. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question. Good evening. Um, of the 10 original options, were those made available to the public on the website? Oh, absolutely. They were? Yeah. So four were carried over to the survey and to the public information session, but the public did have a chance to review the 10. Absolutely. So as, as um, is going on in the Northeast process, you know, multiple options are created, and then if you recall in the Northeast process, they narrowed that down to three. Well, in this case, they narrowed it down to four, um, but all public and all publicly available. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you both very much. We appreciate your presentation. We'll look forward to a public hearing on December 6th, and then this will be back for the board on December 19th. Next on our agenda is item L, um, a report on Lansdowne High School and the renovation preliminary design. Mr. Smith and Mr. Dixit, please come forward. We'll need a little moment while we Yeah, set you up set up.
Please proceed. Mr. Chair, Madam Superintendent, members of the board, it is indeed our pleasure to be here tonight to bring this informational item back. Much anticipated, but we're glad we're here. Um, before I start, I want to say that um, the amount of enriching dialogue that has taken place with our students, our teachers, our administrators, our community, our elected officials has been one of the most robust that I've ever been a part of in my 20 years of doing this work. So we're here now with a, a tremendous amount of community support to present this renovation to you. Before I start, I want to thank the principal, Mr. Kenny Miller. Will you please stand? Kenny Miller has been. <laughs> he has been a stalwart partner in making sure that the school was made available in and around instructional time, time so that we did not disrupt instructions for tours, for questions, for parent engagement, for student engagement related to this process. I am flanked here by um, Mr. Dixit and Mr. John, um, John Domena and Mr. C Dave Caceres uh, who are here. These are our folks who are going to present this to you, but I wanted to make sure that we went over a few things. This item here is definitely being pre presented to you. You can remember back when the board asked the superintendent to go back and direct staff to bring back an enhanced renovation from the first renovation, an enhanced renovation. That renovation was in the neighborhood of 30 plus million dollars. This renovation here will be in the neighborhood of about 60 million dollars. That took some time in order to um, reinvestigate, reevaluate, rediscuss with school, with the school staff, the school communities, the community at large to find out what the needs were. Um, the capital plan that you have um, voted on uh, last sep in September um, included this item, so this is just an informational item for you, but I know it's must anticipate it because we, we were talking about getting you the, rena the enhanced design to you so you could really see how this amazing project will be for our students and our staff. We are extremely excited about where we are and we look forward to your input as it relates to this as we move forward. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Pete Dixit who will then kick it over to our um, external um, independent um, architects and I, before I do that I want to say these gentlemen we have here bring a wealth of knowledge to the table. They're highly credentialed, um, staunch professionals in the region, in the state, and they've done numerous jobs and participations in this county. So these are the guys who really can answer those questions that we've heard a lot of rumors about buildings sinking into the, into the pond, um, about all kinds of things. These folks can give us that assurance that this board needs in order for us to move this project. And we're excited for the opportunity to do that because the Lansdowne community eagerly awaits this wonderful project. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening, Mr. Chair, Madam Superintendent, and members of the board. Most of the things that I had to talk about, Mr. Smith has already covered it. <laughs> Just a couple of items that I'd like to add that I want to say one more time that the project, uh, the, the project was included in the capital improvement program that the board has already approved. So all of the necessary documents about the project have already been submitted. Also, in addition to uh, the external partners that we have here, internal members of my team, I'd just like to acknowledge their presence and uh, all the midnight oil that they have burned, I would like to accept that. And it's by Mr. Merrill Plate, who's the Director of Construction and Improvement, Mike Archbold, who's the staff architect, he's the supervisor from our internal team, Douglas Mullins, Please stand up. He's the staff architect also. And Alice Burley, who's the project manager, she'll be the, respons she'll be the responsible for the construction of the project. With that, I ask Mr. DeMena to start the presentation. Thank you very much, um, John DeMena. I'm a vice president with Rubling & Associates. We're a division of JMT. We're a Towson-based firm. Uh, just to give you a little background, we've been doing work for Baltimore County Public Schools since 1996. Uh, and I personally have been involved in 
the vast majority of those projects. So let's get started. Some of you have seen portions of this presentation back in the spring. The goal is to get everybody on the same page and really focus on the added scope and show you how the program project has evolved since uh, earlier in the year. Uh, just a, a brief agenda. Uh, we're going to go over a lot of information about the general information on the background of the school and then get into the specific details. Can you have to open that door there? Can you crack that door a sec? <coughs> yeah. That's what we've done in the past. Lansdowne High School is located in the southwest portion of the county. Uh, it's located just inside the Beltway uh, on the intersection of Lansdowne and Hollands Ferry Road. Uh, in terms of general information, the existing state rated capacity of the school is 1,420 with a current enrollment as of late October of 1,346 students. It has a series of regional programs building was originally built in 1963 with substantial additions in 1967, 71, and 1973. Here we have a few photographs. This is the current lobby photo of the media center and a typical corridor. Uh, as part of the feasibility study, a number of uh, structural considerations and needs were identified. Uh, we reported on this to the board uh, earlier this year and the end of the previous year. Uh, at the completion of our feasibility study in February, you know, there was evidence that was observed of building settlement. Uh, at that time, there were some initial recommendations for repairs, and the primary recommendation also to include some further investigation of what was discovered. Uh, building on that, uh, some enhanced building inspection was done. Uh, there was a decision to install crack monitors on the cracks on the music room wall uh, on the one side of the building, as well as uh, to develop a schedule for some geotechnical, te geotechnical testing for the building. In July of 2016, after some further inspection, uh, you know, at that point, we had seen no evidence that the building was moving towards the pond, uh, as had been reported in parts of the media. And, but we were also beginning the geotechnical portion of the study. And with, with, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Cazera, our geotechnical engineer, uh, who can go into more detail and substance on exactly what kind of testing was done and what was discovered. Hi, I'm Dave Cozera. Um, yeah, I've worked in the Baltimore County region for about 40 years, drilling holes, looking at all this dirt. I guess maybe the first thing to say is, is that um, the soils on, on the site uh, have been here for between 60 and 80 million years. They're Cretaceous Age, Potomac root sediments. That, that sediment ranges uh, all the way from Harford County down to Washington. So. In a, in a geologic sense, the soils underneath the site have, are well known, built upon, um, have no systemic problems uh, in amongst themselves. Um, when we uh, were asked to undertake this investigation, there was a crack in the music room um, that had previously been underpinned. And by that, there was... Um, piles that were supporting the exterior wall. We did an investigation and we found out that sometime during the construction, prior to and uh, building of this pad for the Lansdowne High School, there was a fill area underneath the, this portion of the building which was causing the settlement. And the underpinning which took place only underpinned the structural wall and didn't underpin the floor nor extend further down the building. And that crack took place right where the underpinning stopped and 
uh, was a rigid point and it met up against the flexible point of the building. The floor slab, uh, which was not previously underpinned, uh, apparently didn't need to be at the time of the first underpinning, but is now part of the second underpinning program. Uh, John and I walked the site. We did go through and we saw uh, two sinkholes, which were uh, not caused by anything geologic, but was caused by something man had done. One was a, uh, a joint in one of the, I think it was a storm drain, uh, yeah, it was a storm drain pipe that had opened up and soil had washed into it, and the other was a, uh, a manhole which somehow had either come off its base, either a snow plow hit it or some kind of, mm, some kind of maybe grass mowing equipment knocked it off its base and caused the sinkhole to develop. But, you know, easily explained items that were <coughs> manifested as sinkholes that are uh, easily repaired. Uh, we did the uh, investigation for, um, I guess, the new elevator and one other addition at that point down sure. sure. and and found that the natural soils were, uh, as I said, 60, 80 million years old, are very competent and um, easily support the kind of structure that's planned. We recently completed a, uh, a couple of borings for the new entryway addition and uh, the that it was an area of the site when the site was graded for the building has a layer of fill on top of it and the original building construction recognized that and I think that's in the administrative area, um, enlarge the footings and we're going to go one step further, we're going to actually underpin that new entryway so it's it will be founded in natural soil uh, below the existing fill that was placed for the building as well. So kind of a belt and suspenders for that little portion of the building as well. Will you just either one of you describe underpinning and piles? Uh, you're going to get to that? Well, I can, I can go into that in detail. So in the case of the area in the music wing where they installed piles in 2000, they basically put in what are referred to as helical piles. They were basically drilled into the earth uh, down to the natural soil through the fill and then attached to the footing and basically that distributes the load all the way down to the, uh, through the fill to what would be, Dave was referring to the natural soil. Uh, as he said, the area right now, the piles go along the one wa wall and turned about 10 feet and stopped and based on his geotechnical testing, they probably should have extended about another 40 feet which would have then got it out of that, that area where there was some fill. Uh, in regard to the proposed addition, uh, we've decided since there is some fill at that area, even though the original building at that point was on larger capacity spread footings, we're going to put that portion on the same type of helical piles. Again, an added level of precaution, a little more conservative design. As you can see, the, um, the amount of extensive work that is taking place to reassure this community that the structure is sound, we've, we've sort of overkilled in some respects to make sure that all of the concerns that have been expressed and all of the um, comments that we've received have been addressed during this renovation, even in the original, as well as an enhanced, um, enhanced options with the um, uh, the renovation is before you now. And I think the important thing to understand is all of the structural concerns that were investigated, uh, discovered, are all correctable and they will all be rectified as part of the addition renovation, addition and renovation project. Uh, the construction documents that were completed last spring basically included repairs for all the issues that had previously been discovered. So there's no surprises, it's not part of the added scope. Uh, and since that time, more investigation has been done. We've been through the site numerous times. In addition, looking for things, looking for things that might be indicative of movement of the building towards the pond, and we haven't found them. And again, all the, all the situations we have found are correctable. Uh, this next slide just shows some of the areas where the additional geotechnical testing was done, uh, concentrated on three areas. 
uh, one associated with the new elevators, one with the south wall of the music wing, and then the third over by the 1971 edition where there was some cracking on some interior walls and a little bit of settlement. So those are the areas we focused on because those are the areas in our uh, repeated surveys of the building determined that there was a need to investigate. In addition, our structural engineer went into the building and got above ceilings, uh, looked into walls, into chases, looking for evidence where the structural frame was showing evidence of distress that would have indicated the building was moving and none was found. So we had work done by the geotechnical engineer as well as by the structural engineer. Next part of the presentation, we're gonna get into describing the project in four essential areas, one on curriculum uh, about the building, safety, and the site. Uh, this first part of the slide uh, shows work scope that was included in the original project. At that time, we were renovating every classroom with new technology, TV monitor, marker boards, new flooring, doors, ceilings, and millwork. The classrooms were being designed for a one-to-one -one tablet use by the students. Full renovation to the media center, including the provisions for a new digital learning classroom, renovating the art classrooms, food and nutrition, technology spaces, music rooms, full renovation to administration, guidance, health, the girls' locker room, the creation of a new TV studio, as well as making the building fully accessible at every level, new auditorium seating and flooring. As part of the expanded scope, with the addition, we were able to add two additional classrooms. The auditorium upgrades were expanded to include new theatrical lighting and a sound system, acoustical panels. Uh, we had meetings with the music, drama, and performing arts sections to talk about their needs for the auditorium, and those are being incorporated into this project. There'll be a new dance studio and sound system, a new recording studio, a new sound system for the gymnasium, a photovoltaic solar panel with a teaching display will be added, and renovation of the boys' locker rooms. In terms of safety, the original design included creation of a secure vestibule, the building would be provided with an automatic fire suppression system, which it currently does not have. The security system would be upgraded with new security cameras throughout the building and on the building exterior. Also provided would be door access control, and the new elevators are also included under safety because it does facilitate movement of students who might be injured during the course of the day. Expanding the scope of work safety-wise is more limited because we were pretty much doing everything as part of the original project. We are adding an emergency generator. We're expanding the bus loop, which will greatly facilitate how buses stack on the site, which creates additional site safety. And we're enclosing the exterior stairs. In terms of the building, uh, originally we were replacing the roof, we still are. Uh, a new air conditioning system would be installed in the building as well as upgrades to the heating portion and ventilation portion of the building. Uh, when, we air condition <clears throat> when we air condition the building, we have to increase outdoor air ventilation, which goes a long way to addressing one of the parents' concerns about molds in the mold in the building. Current Ventilation standards have changed dramatically since 1963. The, in, the domestic water piping will be replaced throughout the building, as will all the light fixtures, both internally and externally, with new LED lighting. There'll be repairs of the floor settlement, wall cracks, wall bowing. All the kitchen equipment in the building will be replaced. With the expanded scope, we'll have the new building entrance and lobby, Carter upgrades, including all new flooring and lockers, a new floor for the gymnasium and, and, bleach, and bleachers. The metal panel on the existing auditorium will be replaced and a new divider in the activity room. With the original project, the work being on, done on the site was quite limited to the elevators, the new chiller, and work at the temporary classrooms. 
with the expanded scope of work, the previously mentioned bus loop will be expanded to better isolate bus and car traffic. As part of the new entrance, we are going to be able to add six parking spaces near the main entry. The existing parking lot will be repaved with new LED lighting. A new parking lot adjacent to the stadium will be created for 40 spaces. In addition, a new bleacher section doubling the seating capacity, press box, and a toilet room concession building will be added. The existing track will get a new running surface. The field event areas will need to be relocated as a result of the parking lot. The existing tennis courts will be resurfaced as part of this project. Uh, during construction, the tennis courts will be used as a location for the temporary classrooms. This aerial map shows uh, clearly where the primary location is for the new exterior site work at the new entrance and also down adjacent to the stadium. This first illustration so shows the configuration of the current bus loop off of Hollands Ferry Road. And this new image shows the expanded bus loop to accommodate double stacking of the existing buses. It also shows how the parking area is being modified around the addition. We're creating a small entrance plaza. Uh, it modifies one of the bus lanes. As I indicated previously, we're able to accommodate six additional parking spaces in this area. With this illustration, uh, you can see the location of all of the ADA features added in terms of the elevators and lifts. Uh, when the 1971 edition was added, the two levels of that building are at half levels to the original building. Dual access elevator will be supplied so that you can get from one part of the building to the other. Uh, there's a half level lift down by the music room as well as over by the cafeteria and then a ramp down to the technology area. Uh, with these additions, the building will be fully accessible. Oh, and I should also add, we're adding an elevator that will make the locker areas also accessible. Uh, the lockers are one level below the gymnasium. The existing main entrance currently allows people to come into the lobby and they have to circulate through a door to the administrative area. With the new addition, it'll include a lobby that has a dual approach. It's visible and accessible from both the bus loop and the parking area. Once school opens during school hours, the double doors into the stair and corridor will be locked. This will require all visitors to go through the administrative area, creating a secure vestibule. This image is of the existing building from the parking lot. Uh, you can see the extension of the canopy, the exterior stair. The proposed addition at this end of the building includes both the main entrance, which is a two-story uh, lobby vestibule area. On the lower level of the addition will be expansion of part of the administrative guidance suite, and it allows the addition of one of the two new classrooms on the second floor. This is the image from the bus loop of the existing building. And then this is the view of the proposed building from the same location. You can see how the entrance works in both directions. You can also see the entrance plaza uh, that leads down to the student parking area. Also move into the existing media center. Gives you an idea of the current layout. Should be noted that the existing media center is of a greater capacity and size than if we were building a new building for whatever reason in 1963 when this building was built. Got a slightly larger library than could be expected. Uh, photograph of the existing library. Uh, the proposed library uh, really incorporates the features that the school system is putting in their new libraries. We have two large group instructional areas isolated at the far side of the library, a collaborative learning area, introduction of soft seating, as well as the digital learning maker space. We now have a couple of images of the proposed library. This is looking from one of the informal seating areas 
looking into what is referred to as the digital cafe, uh, high counters on stools that is becoming a trend in library design. Uh, in the background, you can see a TV monitor for one of the group instructional areas. The library shelving are all in casters so they can be easily moved, creating a great deal of flexibility uh, for the evolution of the library. What's been happening in recent years is the sizes of collections are changing as more digital material is being used. Another view of the library, this is what you see as you enter. Uh, this, this facility has a lot of natural light in the library, which is quite nice. Photograph of a typical classroom. Uh, as you can see, this particular classroom has a number of different generations of technology. And this particular image is of the teaching wall in the new classroom with the uh, monitor and two whiteboards. This particular layout shows one possible furniture configuration using uh, traditional uh, student desks and chairs. Another image showing the rear wall of a classroom as well as what we're referring to as the device ledge, an area where students can take their devices, they can collaborate. The introduction of monitors on the side wall as well as whiteboards showing a different type of furniture in this configuration. Uh, again, furniture that's made to be nested can be set up as individual desks, but also be nested for some collaborative learning. An image of the uh, gymnasium. It's part of the project. The gymnasium is going to obviously be air conditioned. There'll be new flooring, new bleachers. The auditorium, as I indicated earlier, there will be a new full new theatrical lighting and sound system. The introduction of uh, the ceiling will be replaced. Acoustical clouds will be installed as well as acoustical panels on the side walls. Uh, there'll be projection capabilities introduced for the rear wall of the stage. Moving down to the stadium, uh, this site plan shows the configuration of the existing stadium, bleachers, storage building, field event, and softball field. As part of the modifications, you can see the introduction of the new 40-car parking lot with a new concession building and toilet rooms, expansion of the bleachers with a press box. As part of this project, the field event areas will have to be relocated and one of the four softball fields on the site is being deleted. This is an image looking into the stadium with the concession and toilet room building. And to finish the presentation, uh, we have a small animation that walks through portions of the building to give people a better chance of visualizing how the project will impact students. This is the arrival point from the student parking area. As students go to the main entrance, immediately to the, to the right there was a ramp that led up from the handicapped parking spots. This takes, the, takes you into the lobby. As you can see, there's glass into the administrative area, into the adjacent stair. Administrative staff will have full supervisory capabilities of both the lobby and the bus loop from the office. You know, a visitor into the school then will be coming into the main office of counter with the administrative staff before they can go through the office door into what we're referring to as the administration and guidance corridor. You can begin to see some of the panels. There's tack boards on the left. We're now going to go up to the second floor, take you into a typical classroom. Classrooms are situated. The door brings you into the rear of the room. The teacher wall is on the far side. 
this particular layout was showing one of the configurations as shown in one of the still frames earlier in the presentation. And then you can see the shelf on the side wall to allow the students to use, put their device as they do collaborative learning, monitors and whiteboards. From here, we're going to transition and go into the media center. As you can see, the li library has, is fairly dynamic. There was a lot of discussion between the school staff as well as the curriculum gr group with the school system in terms of how the library should be equipped uh, in terms of the types of shelving, the height of the shelvings, the types of furniture. There's a view into the digital learning lab. And then from here, looking back across the library, going through one of the soft seating areas, and then going forward to what we're referring to as the digital cafe. Again, in the background, you can see the, one of the large group instructional areas at the far end of the library. You know, in the new library configuration, one of the expectations is most of the, uh, these tables in the foreground will actually have self-checkout facilities. Uh, the role of the library specialist is evolving. This is a view in one of the in one of the digital labs in the technology area of the building, also connected to the TV studio. It's a combination of computer environment as well as layout tables for doing work with print media after it's been printed. Uh, adjacent to this room is the TV studio. School currently has a small TV studio, but this begins to have the more current technology, typical green wall at the back. And going into the library, excuse me, into the cafeteria, uh, just to give you an idea, of, uh, this particular cafeteria has a lot of very dated pink tile uh, it's all being replaced. And then a view walking into the gymnasium. Uh, again, this floor will be a, an all new floor. They'll have an all new HVAC system, new audio system. Thank you, and if you have any questions. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We need to do the. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, we have here just a, a schedule overview. The original design started in December of 15. Uh, the design restart began in June of 17. Uh, the board approval of the project under the capital improvement program submission in September. Uh, facilities group and plans to begin community engagement in December. The goal was to advertise the project in 2018 with board approval in April, notice to proceed in May with the goal of construction to begin on the building in June. The site work portion down by the stadium is on a slightly different path because of the site review process in Baltimore County. Goal was to advertise the site package in July with that having board approval in October, but substantial completion for both portions of the project in August of 2020. Now, Mr. Stewart and then Ms. Eaton. Well, I have a long series of questions. Sorry. Okay, Don, go first. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. You said you're going to add two classrooms. Where would they be located, and what are the sizes? Okay, so the one of the classrooms is. The classrooms are on this, and one of the classrooms is on the second floor of the addition. It's about 
800 and excuse me, about 900 square feet and one is going to be an area on the f first floor. It's going to be about 850 square feet. Uh, it's an area, you know, one of the things that happens is because of the program to accommodate admin guidance and health is much bigger than currently. So as the floor evolved and plan, the guidance suite is actually portions of guidance is down into the addition area, but that then freed up some space on the floor to create the second classroom. And what are the average sizes of the classrooms now? The average size in the existing building? Uh, they range, uh, so about, there's 15% of the rooms are greater than 750 square feet, which is the basic guideline. Uh, there are between 700 and 740, there's about another 25%. There's 14 rooms, or 36%, right around 700 square feet. Uh, there's four rooms in the 689 to 694. Uh, there's there are four rooms that are in the 500 to 550 square foot range, which are much smaller than typical. Uh, a couple of those are currently used as ROTC rooms. One is being used as an office, uh, and one is being used as a special ed classroom. Okay, and will all the classrooms have two doors? Uh, no, they'll have one door. All uh, the classrooms will have one? Right, and none of them are required by code to have two doors. Uh, the decision was made to eliminate one of the doors, that increases the usability in the room. Uh, the way the building code works is any room that has more than 50 people in it needs to have two exits. Uh, the exception is the state for any science lab generally prefers to have, generally requires there to be two, uh, room, two doors, and all the science labs will have two doors, but the typical classroom which is size to house 32 students only requires one door. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Now, Mr. Stewart. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, Kevin, I'm not sure I've seen you as animated as you were at the beginning uh, of this presentation. But I wanted to say thanks for your hard work. I know uh, we went back to the drawing board in, in March 2017, and so there's a, a lot that's been done here. But it is the worst facility in the county, so, um, I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time of kind of going through the concerns I've heard, concerns I have, uh, to make sure that we're touching on everything. Um, board members, I'm sorry. This is kind of the opportunity to do it. Hopefully it touches on some of your concerns uh, as well. So number one, I think we, we start with uh, the school sinking into the pond. I mean, to be fair, this school is very close, at least on one side of it, to the water there. And so I need to know whether you guys are able to conclude with a, a high degree of probability uh, and certainty that it's not going to fall into the ground or fall into the pond. We have to, we have to get it right. Could you repeat that? No, I mean, there, 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 there's no evidence that we saw that the building has shifted towards the pond and there's no reason to believe that in this geologic setting that there was anything that would cause it to it. Well, we know that the building has cracks, so we know that it's moving, don't we? The building has cracks due to settlement, yes. So isn't that indicative of potentially a problem where the building would slide into the pond? No. Why? when all the cracks are being explained as a settlement of softer soils beneath the foundation, much like you would have in a house. So is that soft soil, um, that's near the water, is it not? Is it near the water? I mean, it is the, the soft soil that are near the cracks that in the music room are certainly not the near, they're, they're on the water side, sure. All right, so are, are we fully addressing those issues? So yes, we're, we're providing a positive foundation support for what, that portion of the building. What's, what's that mean? So where there is evidence of the settlement, as was explained earlier, the crack is occurring where when they partially underpinned the one side of the building, which was one wall, and they turned 10 feet, the cracks occur where those piles stopped. Okay, so, so the one, so one pace became very rigid as part of our investigation, 
both in terms of the original drawings when the building was originally built and some of the geotechnical work we did, we determined the fill probably extended about 40 feet down that wall. We're adding piles in that area. When you get beyond the 40 feet, the footings in that area are on what would have been considered natural soil. So we're continuing something that should have probably been done in 2000. No one's here today who was there to know why they didn't go further. Uh, uh, but, how but, many piles are we driving into the ground? Uh, along that wall, you know, I'd say but on the wall there's probably 20 or 30 in addition to the to putting the piles under the wall at that portion when we replace the slab in the music room we're also putting the piles under the slab okay so we're and so you guys you guys are willing to base your you know your reputation and what you're doing here on that on that conclusion that this is going to be shored up i am and i will be the one architecturally who will be signing and seal the drawings as required by the state of maryland all right Nick, really quickly, before you leave that line, you mentioned um, they did one side and then turned a corner and went, I guess, 10 feet. So what you're saying, I'm looking at kind of a map. Um, they went down the Third Avenue street side, putting piles there, and then when they turned and was on the river side, or the lake side, excuse me, they only went 10 feet, whereas they should have kept going an additional along that wall? Correct. Okay. I only defer to you because you have the beard as well. So, oh. yeah. it's, um, it's Movember. Good yeah, yeah. Work, guys. <laughs> and I gotta, I gotta respect it. And he's an engineer. There you go. <laughs> Electrical. <laughs> um, we've also heard of water underneath the, the school. There have been stories about how engineers are quote unquote living out there to try to figure out why there's water that's appearing underneath the, underneath the school. Can you guys address that? Absolutely. Isn't this a conspiracy? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, it, it feels as though there's, you know, something being covered up. Is there not? No, actually, our goal was to try to expose things, and so we understand why. Uh, this past summer, uh, there was, well, excuse me, there was source of water leaking into one of the mechanical rooms adjacent to some underground pipes that were going under the corridor that runs by the, from the cafeteria to the gymnasium. Uh, <clears throat> Over the summer, we thought, because it's concealed, nobody can see it, four pipes were rerouted above the ceiling. Uh, the leaking continued. Uh, when that work was finished, say, early August, uh, we then elected to hire a company called Gardner Engineering, who does a lot of leak investigation work. I've personally worked with them. Since 1993, projects such as the Public Safety Headquarters in Towson, they have an underground plaza. They're currently working on the design of the waterproofing for Patriots Plaza adjacent to the courthouse. Uh, they've actually been going in and doing actual leak testing where they're trying to make the building leak. And one of the things they've discovered, and, and they started very systematically, they start at the roof drains, and what they discovered is uh, <clears throat> they could make the building leak. And the primary source of it is the, there was a roof leader on the cafeteria that feeds to a roof drain that went under an open courtyard, which is now the activity room, which is one of the subsequent additions. Uh, the piping was scoped and they found breaches in the underground rain leader. At the back of the activity room, they actually did a test pit, and they've done it twice. The first time they did it is when they were leak testing to see if any water went into it, and after a couple days of testing, they were able to get water to go into it. After one of the recent rainstorms, they actually re-excavated the test pit the day after a Sunday rain to see how much water was in the pit, and then they actually tried leak testing again, and they saw the water level change in this pit. Subsequent to that, then, we actually had the rain leaders and the underground pipes scoped. Uh, they started last week on Friday. They didn't finish. They finished, actually, yesterday, and they found breaches in two pipes. One of the pipes, we know exactly where it is. The other one, we're still investigating it. Uh, so there are a lot of issues with the pipes, it seems. 
These are rain leader pipes, so these are parts of the building, and these are things that will have to be addressed. Oh, so they are being addressed yes. within the scope. So one of the things that's interesting that they do is when they put the camera into the pipe, they actually attach electrodes to it. So they then can take utility locating equipment. We've all heard the ads for Miss Utility. They actually take equipment into the building, and they can find where that charged line is so they can track where the camera is. So they have found breaches in those pipes, and one of them under the activity room is the source, we believe, of the water going both into the mechanical room and into the locker rooms. So you think we've run it all the way down? I'm sorry? Do you think we've run the issue all the way to the ground? We know what it is. Uh, we're, cl we're close. All right. Uh, I'm not going to say definitively because one of the things that they did find is they were doing it, the breach in the pipe. They could only get the camera so far. So one of the things we're talking about, excavating the activity room is very expensive. To get to a pipe, probably just going to be rerouting the rain leaders to a new chase, bring it down, and then run a tie out to the outside of the building. So we'll probably abandon those pipes in place but replace them with a new system. I understand. Um, the 2014 facilities assessment uh, talks about water damage in the ceilings is, I mean, I'm guessing this might be related a little bit or is it related to the roof? Can you just talk about that issue? So the entire roof is being replaced. So any water damage that would have been in ceilings uh, should be corrected. We're putting all new ceilings in, but all of the roofing is being redone in the entire building. And so we think that's going to address whatever that should leak just address any roof leaks. Okay. And part of the area in this, by the drain from this activity room or the pipe under the activity room, we believe is the source of the water that was going into the one locker room along that one wall because that, the locker room wall is the same wall when you go up through the building which is contiguous to the activity room. All right, what about the repeated alleged flooding that's taking place in the auditorium? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that was a one-time incident it happened once. Uh, it hasn't happened since. Kenny, was that once? One time. Okay. To the best of our knowledge, we don't know if there was a blockage that might have cleared itself through pressure. Uh, we've actually tried to replicate it and try to track down what caused it. And again, it's been unknown. And I believe, Ken, was that about a year ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. Um, the 14 facilities assessment also says that the exterior skin of the building is failing. Can you address what that means in, uh, in particular and what we're doing? Okay, so since the 2014 assessment was done, all of the curtain wall in the entire building has been replaced. And then as part of our project, we're going around any cracks, any areas we think needs to be repointed, where we see small little hairline cracks or deteriorating mortar is being replaced. Can, can you just dumb that down for me? I don't understand what that means. Uh, mortar and building ages, uh, if we went around and we saw areas where we might have seen what I will call hairline cracks, so where that's it's a separation of the mortar and the brick, but it's not a structural crack. Okay. So that's what was meant by exterior skin was failing. Exterior skin. And then as part of the 1971 edition, some of the aggregate panels uh, have some deterioration. Those are being replaced. Okay. Let's talk about the bowing in the walls. It, um, it, we've heard, you know, um, and we've seen, in fact, that there is a wall, at least one of them, that bows out and then is not aligned. Can you speak to that? Okay. So it's going to be repaired as part of this project. Uh, it's a curious bow because there's no cracking in the wall. It just bows. Uh, we're not sure if it was built that way. It's at both corners, but that's all going to be repaired as part of this project. Are you, do you have concerns about bowing more generally? Uh, no. All right. Um, as far as the geotechnical testing is concerned, you tested three areas, as I understand it, from the, the map. Is that sufficient for us to actually make conclusions regarding the entire property itself? The, there was a geotechnical investigation done at, when the building was built, so those, those borings were available to us. The grading which showed where the fill was placed was made available to us. And w in the areas of concern, either because they were concerned about cracking or settlement, the music room in particular, or areas where we were going to add new load, those are the areas investigated. By and you all? Yes. Okay. 
And what and your conclusion was that they are sound or that they can be fixed. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've heard allegations that a renovation like this uh, really can't address some of the crowding issues that are there regarding flow of traffic. We'll start with that student flow of traffic. Okay. So there's a lot of students in the school. One of the things we're going to do is to address it where we can. Uh, one area of particular concern is on the first floor, there's a stair adjacent in the admin wing that comes down to the first floor where it intersects student traffic that's coming down the corridor to get to the main lobby to exit the building. It's a particular concern. and. I guess a week and a half ago we were there at a meeting at dismissal and you can see the confluence of the two groups of, of students. One of the things we're doing as part of this edition, on the first floor, uh, the students coming down the first floor corridor, we're actually creating a new corridor that goes immediately out to the bus loop so they don't have to walk down through the lobby. The stair in question is being removed and put in the addition at the end. So students on the second floor who come down that stair will now have two choices. They can go out a door directly to the student parking area or another door through the lobby to the bus loop. So uh, this in, in your opinion, is that the major flow issue? Is that, or is it one uh, of the major flow issues? It gets crowded over at the area where they call Sunshine Alley, where you go from the academic wing over towards the cafeteria. Uh, Unfortunately, we're kind of landlocked there in terms of uh, what we could do. There was a brief discussion about creating another corridor, but that would have meant sacrificing educational space because we would have had to go through a classroom. So, you know, crowding becomes a problem, but I think people have to remember it's crowded in the corridor for five minutes. It's not always the best. I think the situation at the main lobby is particularly one of the worst because students are hurrying to get out of school but at the end of the day. we're addressing that. I'm like, sorry. We're addressing that. We're addressing that. Right. And the rationale behind what the entrance is is to disperse students out of multiple access points as opposed to right now, you've got 80, 80 so percent of the students all going through one access point right there by the office. So we're trying to disperse that so that will help ease the traffic flow that's coming in and out of the schools during the high peak areas of arrival and dismissals. All right. Let's talk about classrooms because, uh, except for I think a few spaces, maybe I don't know a handful, four or five, we're not changing a lot of the space that is available. So how are we going to address uh, perceived overcrowding? You know, book bags laying around, people stepping over each other, bumping into each other, all of that. Well, I'll start and then I'll. <laughs> book bags won't change. Students will have book bags, but we'll have, um, with the lockers we'll have now, will be accessible so that they can store more of their equipment. With the devices, we're, we're hoping that that's going to ease some of the um, amount of materials that students would need. In addition to this project here, with the range of the size of the classrooms, we have to make sure that we have furniture that is flexible for those spaces. So um, the traditional classrooms that maybe some of us, except for Josie, is used to, will be, it won't be that traditional type of classroom. It'll be different space that is more conducive to the sizes of the room. The, the rooms are not necessarily small. There are range that are approved by the state. And we're in that range, but some of them vary in sizes. Well, how we're going to address that is with some of the casework that's taking place in those classrooms, the technology, the, the distribution of how the instructional spaces will be, in addition to making sure that we have the appropriate types of furniture in those classrooms that will create better flexibility in all of those aspects. Who helps to select the furniture? I mean, what does that process look like? It will be the our architect, our staff, and principal. They'll all get together. And, and determine the right type. When of we work. say principal, we mean the principal and their teams. So it's, yes, yes. Okay. Going back to the class size, Please. 34 of the 38 classrooms are within the state range. And, and the remaining four, three out of them, are not being used as regular classrooms. What is the state range? It's 600 to 800 square feet. All right. How many students? Uh, Ms. Eaton asks for how many students? For standard class size, 20 to 25 is 27 students. Good enough. What, within the, within some so, so the, the ed spec calls for you know, 28 to 32 students. The ed spec calls for 28 to 32. 
I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a typical classroom. You know, hopefully it's 28, but often it's 32. Right. And, you know, it depends on the subject. Okay. Uh, we've heard about level changes in the school and trying to make this school ADA compliant. And we might do it by the book, but by the spirit, it could be a problem for folks to have to use lifts or interrupt the flow of an already difficult uh, flow of traffic. You know, can you talk to, talk to me about what that would look like? So where we have, the, the solution we have here, we have in a number of schools. Uh, it's very similar to the type of thing we had to do at Hereford. Uh, there we actually have one platform lift in a stair tower uh, because they had a few classrooms on a level that was no other way to get there. The half levels, uh, you know, the area that's probably gonna be most congested is one by the cafeteria. Uh, because that's where you have more students going. The one to the music wing is only serving a couple of classrooms. The one to the technology wing is only serving a few classrooms. You know, our experience is it tends not to be disruptive. Uh, at the area of the cafeteria, we have a wide stair. Uh, again. When you say it is not disruptive, what are you referring I don't, to? I don't see the lift being disruptive. It's gonna be a fold down lift that's only obstructing it's only reducing the stair while it's actually being used. It's not in place all the time, narrowing the width. Are we using ramps as well? Uh, we have one area where we are using a, ra a ramp because the layout of the room and the positions of the doors allowed us to do that. Do you recall the area? It's the going down to the technology wing. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, what about uh, disabled or injured students uh, having difficulties accessing the fields? Are we addressing that? So the path between the building and the stadium will be made ADA accessible. And then we're also adding, obviously, the parking lot that's being added in that area will be ADA compliant. There will be ADA spaces down there which currently don't exist. No, I see. All right. And that was a pretty significant issue in in, but that we currently exist now. So this is certainly going to improve that footprint for our athletic facilities to make sure that students and family members and community members who may have, um, who may need that particular ADA accessible, it's, it's definitely there and it's, in, it's welcoming to all of our community. And the, and the bleachers, you know, the, the, you know the, the first row of the bleachers elevated for sight lines. There will be ramps up to the base level of the bleacher. All right. Uh, what about the community schools model? Has any thought gone into the interrelation between the two, or you know, the use of space at this point? Certainly, in working with the school administration, where um, the space that that we are renovating is incorporate of all of the ideas that currently exist there now. The, the goal here in this renovation is to make the space flexible. So I think that we've addressed all of that, but once again, that'll be a part of an, an instructional rollout and programming that, that could be fluid. So I can't necessarily tell you today that um, this classroom is for that. The building is incorporate of all of the um, planning that we've gotten from uh, Mr. Miller and his team, as well as community input related to the educational specs for uh, different types of programming that are there now and others that could go there in the future. All right, John. Uh, what about, I mean, overall overcrowding? The idea that this project is going to be delivered, it's going to be overcrowded the moment it's delivered, and then over the long haul, it'll be overcrowded. Well, um, I think we're going to let that question get answered by Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown, who is, uh, can give you more information related to the enrollment. Good evening. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. So, um, in students' count, if you look at the, the the building, will be slightly overcrowded. It, it peaks in 2023 um, at 92 students over capacity, current capacity. The addition of the two classrooms actually cuts that over capacity by half. So it brings it in around 50 kids over capacity, at which point the enrollment declines. So, um, you know, I think when the building comes online, uh, it's in line with the enrollment of the building. Do we have a sense of the, um, those trends, the, the underlying basis of the trends? So uh, in terms of our projections, uh, 
and pleased to say that this year uh, we came in within 41 students of, of our projected <laughs> total for the, the system as a whole. Uh, our enrollment projections have been uh, quite accurate on years two and three, and we, uh, when we updated the methodology, we actually retro-tested it uh, for about five years, so I feel fairly confident that, that uh, okay. we're estimating the need. All right. Uh, we'll move on. I'll let you go for now. <laughs> I, know I'm, I know I'm taking a lot of time here, folks. Um, there's allegations that the renovation is not going to meet the Pikesville standard that we talked about because Pikeville, Pikesville is not in as worse a condition. That's not true because uh, the amount that we are spending on this building is uh, several million, tens of millions more than what we spent in Pikesville. So this is this will set a new gold standard for our renovation. That was the goal that superintendent laid out for us, and I think we have done that. But I do need to add a caveat to that. School buildings have different square footage. So just because we are spending $60 million for this Lansdowne project, it doesn't necessarily mean that another school will need exactly 60 million. It may be less or it may be more, yes. but this project, based on the square footage and the nature of this renovation, it is coming in in excess of 60 million, our projection. So okay. I needed to say that because we don't need to have that perception in the community that everybody gets 60 million. Everybody may not need 60 million. We, we want to build quality instructional programming schools that meet 21st century learning environment. So what about systems that we're not touching? Aren't they going to be very expensive to try to fix going forward? Isn't that an issue? We're not touching. The only thing we're not touching is the concrete slab on grade, the steel frame, the new windows, the ex, you know, so we're, we're we're patching down. exterior brick, all the systems within the building, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, IT, they're all being touched. Which are the core, com which are the core components of a limited renovation. Except so. the windows that have already been replaced. Right, last, in 2016. Right. What about community input? What is that gonna look like, Kevin? We have worked extremely closely with Mr. Miller, and Mr. Miller has been in touch with the community folks. We have also talked to Recreation and Park that have significant programs there. They have looked at our designs. In addition to that, um, we're gonna work with Mr. Miller over the month of December to have um, a, a, a community meeting at their PTA meeting. Not every board, not every member in the community can come to a board meeting and see this presentation. We have it online, it will be online. The easels that you will see here and, and others will be assembled in the current existing school now so that parents and students that they come in can kind of see how that looks. But we're gonna give one more presentation just like this to the entire PTA and any community members who wanna come. For those who may not be able to be here tonight, just at another step to give parents an opportunity to engage the project and see the wonderful work that's taking place. If I could just add um, to that again, we just want to make sure that the, the community has an opportunity to see the same presentation, that they can hear that same information. Again, our children need the best of the best, and so we want to make sure that they have a, a access to a 21st century learning environment. I was not going to sign off on any project that didn't have a comprehensive uh, renovation. In terms of what's being touched, everything is being touched with the, ex um, with the exception of the slab and the windows. And so it is a comprehensive renovation, and I just wanted to say that out loud because I think it's important for our community to know that. All right, I'll wrap it up just for, for now. I'll probably have more questions later on for you guys. But um, John, you know, you designed the project. Um, I think, you, you know, you have the best sense of what this is going to ultimately look like once it's delivered. Um, how would you feel if your son or daughter was going to the school? I think it's going to be a great project. Uh, you know, from the board standpoint, we've worked on the renovation of Stonely Elementary School, Catonsville Elementary School, buildings that started in the 1920s, much older than this building. We worked on the Hereford High School renovation, building that started in 1949. Uh, we're, touching every, we're touching more spaces in this building than we did in Hereford. Uh, we're, so we're, we're touching everything. When someone walks into the building, it's gonna look and feel like a new building. I mean, when I walk in, when you walk into the lobby, and you walk into the corridors, 
it's going to bear no resemblance of what it looks like today. And so in that sense, I'm very happy with what it's going. Now, if you ask me, gee, would you like to be designing a new high school? Well, sure, we'd like to be not designing new buildings. But this building has good bones. In spite of some of the concerns about the settlement, I can pick isolated areas in the Stoney Project, the Catonsville Project, the Hereford Project, where we had unique structural situations in those buildings that were different but similar. Uh, no more of a threat than that they were here, and they were, they were dealt with. They didn't have a pond that someone said maybe the building's sliding into as a convenient foil. Uh, and this building in the one area had, you know, in the music area, has some settlement issues that we will be addressing. But this building on the inside is going to look like a new building. It's going to feel like a new building, and from a technological standpoint, it's going to be the, the, the exact same systems and curriculum that would be delivered in a new school. All right, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Stewart addressed a lot of what I was going to ask you, but um, I understand then that the only addition then is that entryway, is that right? It's the entranceway and the adjacent space. So there's uh, on the ground floor, the first floor, there's part of the guidance areas in the addition and then one of the new classrooms in the addition on the second floor. So it's the lobby, the stair that's now an exterior stair being brought inside. And what happens is when we eliminated the exterior stair and the one internal stair, that stair became bigger, so it can it's going to accommodate more students. So how much square footage is being added? It's around 5,000 square feet. 5,000. Okay. Um, uh, we talked about a lot of this, but I, I'm going to run through a few other things that, that stakeholders have brought up. Um, again, the undersized classrooms. You talked about what the requirements are, but that's not really going to change. For the existing building, no, it does not. Um, replacement of bathroom fixtures was brought up. Bathrooms are being totally renovated. They'll be fully ADA compliant. Now they said the drainage portion of the plumbing. I know you said you were touching on all the systems. What is happening with that? Uh, the plumbing drains are being replaced. Um, electrical, what is the scope of that? Is that complete? Yes. I mean, there might be a few minor things we're not touching, but yes, because we're getting all new lighting, new power outlets. Uh, the lighting is going to be LED. Uh, we're getting new technology in terms of IT. Uh, it is going to require, when we air conditioning the building, the electric switch gear, the main electric service coming into the building is being upgraded because the existing doesn't have the capacity to handle the new air conditioning. And this might be a question for Dr. Brown. Um, we talked about the potential for some overcrowding for at least a few years. Is that, could that affect the magnet status? or the um, success of the community school pilot there? No, actually, I can answer that, because okay. you're only talking about about 50 kids over projection, which can be handled with a short-term type of solution through relocatables. That wouldn't have any impact at all on the MAGNA program. OK. Mm -hmm. And um, you talked about ADA compliance, but the way it's being described is there's no way for someone to get there's no lift that goes from the bottom floor to the top floor, is that right? They would actually have to go, if they were going from the bottom floor to the top, they would have to actually go across the building, is, is that correct? So the, uh, there's no one spot in the building where you can get to every level from one elevator because of the half levels. So if a student's on the, you know, on the first floor and wants to get to the second floor of the main building or the second floor of the 1971 edition or any floor in the 71 edition, they will have to go to the elevator. So there was a concern that there really wouldn't be enough time between classes for a student 
who's in a wheelchair or whatever the situation is well, that, to that, actually make it. Once again, that's an instructional decision that the principal and their team can address. That, that necessarily, that's not our engineers to do that. That's something that can be worked out with the administration as it relates to scheduling and where classes are. So that once again, the ADA will allow all students who have disabilities to be able to access the building in various access points and um, having that and having that ADA accessibility fit the current footprint of the building. So we're not changing any of the footprint of the building. So it, it will be ADA, ADA accessible and any of those specific cases would have to be addressed with the principal and their teams and staff. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, heating system getting replaced. It's all being upgraded as part of the renovation. Uh, storage space, um, the stakeholders are saying that currently they're occupying a hallway for storage of supplies and that there's no additional storage space being planned for that. One advantage of the addition, we were able to accommodate some additional storage on the one wing where the addition's going. It's part of its uh, accommodated as in, in the admin area, uh, but you're right, in other parts of the building, you know, the focus really was on main, maintaining the curriculum spaces so we can deliver the educational program. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, one of the benefits of doing these renovations is we end up cleaning out a lot of storerooms that haven't been cleaned out for a generation. And, you know, when you go through these schools, there's so much product in rooms. Uh, and we saw it at Hereford High School. We had the same complaint, and then when they cleaned out a lot of inf a lot of things as part of the move, it does provide a good opportunity for the school to purge itself of a lot of excess material, which is taking up valuable space. Once again, this is one of the processes that the school administration, when they with the renovation, we're going to be touching so much space that it gives them an opportunity to reprogram existing space as it relates to storage and things of that nature. And exactly what John said, in some of our other renovations, after we do these projects, um, items that have been there for a long time that have not moved, we get, a, we get a chance to turn them over. And what we realize in most of these, it's space there, but it's it's been occupied for um, items that have had quite a bit of dust on them for years and years of um, inactivity. And another one area where we are going to be able to accommodate some storage, at the rear of the auditorium there two tiered rooms, uh, one which is being used as a classroom, one is just being used as a catch-all storage space. One of those rooms, we're taking out the tiered seating and it's where we're moving and creating the new dance studio. On the other side is we're creating a larger storage room for the uh, auditorium program. Uh, so that's gonna be an added plus and that's an area that they have storage scattered all over the building, or excuse me, all over the auditorium area. And then obviously, there's going to be no change in the proximity to the pond. <laughs> no, there won't. Nothing you can do about a renovation on that. Unfortunately, um, no. I, I have to say that it, this is frightening, and it's frightening to a lot of people, and it's frightening to me, um, especially if you look at some of, there have been some other renovations that were inadequate that became nightmares over time after the renovation you know, more money had to be dumped in. So this is a little scary. Um, I do think that this board knows that Lansdowne needs a new building. And the evidence of that is that we supported new buildings for Delaney and Towson. And those buildings are not in as bad condition as Lansdowne. So um, I do believe that there's still a path for Lansdowne to get a new building but I doubt that it's gonna occur under the current county leadership, which is of course our funding source. Um, instead, we're moving toward committing millions to a reno, which will put Lansdowne out of consideration for a new building for decades, and we'll commit our future board and county leadership to dealing with the problems caused by a Band-Aid solution. If we delayed the renovation for a year, the new board and the new county leadership could make the prudent decisions to give Lansdowne what it needs and save itself the headaches we would commit them to with an inadequate renovation. 
right now Lansdowne is not in line for a new school. A one-year delay, which could open the door to a new building, is not putting them further behind. It's putting them in line. So I would like to make a motion. I move that the board directs BCPS to delay further progression on the Lansdowne renovation until February 2019 so as not to functionally preclude the possibility of a replacement building. Can we finish discussing with the engineer before we entertain a motion? Yeah, we are, we are going to do that. Um, we're going to let the discussion go with, with the panel here, and we can have a motion at the end of the conversation. Um, but the question is whether you're asking to change the, the already approved capital budget. But so think about that while we continue the discussion and we'll come back and visit your um, proposal. Ms. Schaefer. Okay. Hi. Um, so I had a question about the process of renovation. Do you know how many um, trailers or learning cottages you're going to get at the initial start? And right now we're, we're, we're trying to finalize that. It's going to be between 10 and 12. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and the reason I'm saying is we, we've developed First, a complete phasing plan had been developed as part of the prior renovation design. When the scope was ex expanded and adding the entrance addition, it had us to completely rethink because in the original plan, the administrative area was going to be part of phase one. Okay. With the construction of the addition, you know, we're re rethinking that because we see the addition being completed at the end of summer too and we want to time the renovation of the administrative guidance area to be complete mm -hmm. concurrent with that uh we've had our two rounds of discussions on how we see the phasing plan developing at this point it's going to be 10 or 12. it's probably not going to be less and it's definitely not going to be more uh, some of the considerations we have to look at is with the temporaries, do we do an oversized double classroom that we could possibly use for, say, an art classroom, an art studio? Because uh, one of the challenges with these multi summer renovations is how can we do reduce the massive amount of work that has to happen in the summer because special spaces that are only one of or are difficult to put in temporaries like technology spaces, art rooms, uh, music rooms, those have to occur in the summer as do auditoriums, media centers, and admin and guidance. And all of that, Josie, takes place the same way it happened at Pikesville mm -hmm. in conjunction with the principal and the administrative team. Once again, instructional programming, we work around the instructional programming. So we, we can't give you good estimates now because that's that program is a little bit further out and it will it will depend on what the instructional needs are and what relocatables but all of that is built into the um, the total project cost for this project are these the big the big trailers or are it, these the it depends on what the site will okay. hold and how yeah and the, the goal is to have the big trailers mm -hmm. uh, and it will have a toilet room in the temporary facility mm -hmm. which was probably going to be your next question <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's our current thinking uh, in the old renovation we were going a different path but because of how it's evolved we feel that's necessary to be successful at this location so you said it's on the tennis courts um, that's correct when so my school I go to Pikesville and then when we had our renovations we were on top of the soccer and like baseball fields mm -hmm. where are you gonna put the tennis kids so Fortunately, the uh, you know the tennis team will use the courts at the middle school, which is across the street. So we do have some adjacent facilities that are very close, and we've already discussed that. You know, it, it's come up in our phasing meetings and okay. discussions. Cool. And that principal is a part of that discussion as mm -hmm. well. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Young. Did you have your hand up? Yes. So <clears throat> we heard one parent, you know, speak about the mold issue, and I believe in your. Um, discussion earlier about changing around the HVAC, I think you might have said that'll correct mold. So do we know if there is mold there and that school will go through a remediation process? In those areas where mold is occurring, most of those materials are being removed. Uh, if they're not, if they're permanent materials like masonry, they'll be cleaned. Uh, you know, right now, the, 
buildings that were designed in the 1960s had very limited fresh air requirements. Typically, you had exhaust fans in the bathrooms, and you opened the windows. The building was an air, you know, the building wasn't air conditioned. Uh, with this project, we're going to be having outdoor air. We have what's called a DOAS system, so it's one of the current trends in HVAC design. But if you go back about 15, 20 years when there was the sick building syndrome, syndrome, the ASHRAE standards, American Society of Heating and Air Conditioning Engineers modified the fresh air requirements for the buildings and schools. So this building will have constant ventilation and fresh air being drawn into the building at all times, which you know basically gives you air movement even when you're not needing to supply air conditioning in the bridge months like October and November and early May, you'll be given what we refer to as free cooling. You'll be bringing outdoor air in. And then you know, when it's either being air conditioned or heat, heated, this fresh air that's coming into building will be tempered. OK. And associated with that um, asbestos, I mean, is that mainly in the ceilings, the ceiling tiles? Is that where uh, um, let me try to answer that. Every building has an asbestos management plan that tells us exactly where the asbestos is. So when we go through the renovation project, we follow that asbestos management plan, and asbestos is removed in compliance with the HERA during hours when children are not present in the school. Okay. And it's all being removed. Any, any asbestos in the building is being removed. Uh, we've had a detailed survey by an industrial hygienist go through the building, test it, produce an environmental report, and actually have construction documents documenting what materials are in what rooms that are to be removed. And it was all part of the cost estimates for the project. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Eaton and then Ms. Causey. Hypothetically, if we did come up with the money for a new school, does Lansdowne have land to build a new school? We haven't done that analysis because right from day one, the talk was about if the project started with an air conditioning project, mm -hmm. gradually expanded to limited renovation, then to enhanced renovation. So if any statement we make at this time, whether it has land or not, it would be not backed by any analysis or study. But okay. if you just look at it, it appears there's plenty of land there. All right. How big is the site? Uh, the total site is, I believe, 60. Uh, I have you know, off the top of my head, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the uh, acreage. Yeah. The total site is uh, 56.41 acres. And how many acres are we normally assigned to a new high school? It is within that range. It's 45 to 60 acres. But the school building itself, not the entire the stu site. The school building is a couple of hundred thousand, 260,000 square feet or something like that. So there's plenty of land there. But no analysis has been done whether the land uh, is right for another building. So Mrs. Causey. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation and for your patience. Um, as you know, this is a very important decision for the board to make. Um, the Lansdowne community is a special community. They are dedicated to their school. Um, despite all of the facility um, problems there, they you know, really appreciate the, the teaching and learning that goes on there and the administration and the teachers that are dedicated to those students. So I appreciate your patience. Um, I have some questions. One related back to um, someone else's question. So how long has there been water leaking into the boys' locker room? I don't know. We know that um, I, don't, I don't have a schedule of how long it's been in there. So um, any areas that have been brought to us, facilities has, has charted that and has tried to put remedies in place. But um, I can't tell you that that is an existing problem that I'm aware of. But since we are going to replace all plumbing and all fixtures, regardless of how long it was there, that won't be an issue. Okay. Um, the point kind of being that it seems as if it's been a chronic problem, but it's taken really increased pressure to, uh, to get the scrutiny needed to find out what the problem was and to come up with a solution, um, which is a concern because what else is out there? Um, the other thing I was going to ask, and this goes along with Ms. Eaton, um, 
does your firm do life cycle studies where you compare the long-term costs of replacement buildings over renovations? They do. What uh, the question in this case is that we never talked about replacing the building. If we ever, if we start the project with replacing the building, then the state requires life cycle costing and a detailed feasibility study. When you submit a project as limited renovation or enhanced renovation, that study is not required. Now, without the benefit of study, in most of the cases, a building like this, it, it is more cost effective to do renovation. In your opinion, in my, but in not my a professional opinion. study yes. that's yes. done by, yes. by companies that yes. do that. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Eaton already asked the question about is there a feasible site on uh, on the Lansdowne High School site to do a replacement school, and the answer is unknown because that study wasn't done either. Um, also, talking about the plan, the um, timeline that's projected, it has as its last statement substantial completion, but when is the actual completion? Substantial completion is actually the actual completion. This is what we have for all projects. There's always a series of punch outs and follow ups that take place over the next year. So the building will be ready for occupancy um, for that school year that starts in 20. In 20, okay. And then um, thank you for talking about the other projects that you've done for Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, Catonsville Elementary School where the uh, former building was gutted and then completely redone from the inside out. There were no students in the building at the time, is that correct? That's correct. And Stonely Elementary School also had no students in the building? That's correct. Okay, because they were moved over to the old Carver Arts mm -hmm. after the new Carver Arts was mm -hmm. built. And then when the Stonely students moved back to Stonely, then the Carver Arts old building was demolished and their fields built. Okay, thank you. So that's a model that we've used before. Um, and the Hereford um, project had two builders, so or two um, companies that were working on it. Um, so I don't know who, which one was there at the time, but my students were there at the time. So I was there at the time. And it is quite disruptive. It's disruptive to teaching, it's disruptive to learning, it's disruptive to leaving the classroom and running into the bathroom and then coming out and finding out you're in a hard hat area and a construction worker's yelling at your 14-year-old daughter because she's not in the right place at the right time. <coughs> um, there's also issues of things that can happen while construction is happening. And we all know that you can plan and you can be careful, um, but there was in fact a time when during the Hereford renovation an HVAC system fell through the roof, through the sprinkler system and into the music room and the sprinkler system leaked and flooded the music room and so um, instruction was disrupted for piano classes and other classes. So we understand that there are things that can happen that you can plan for but will in fact be potentially dangerous and disruptive to the students and to the programming. So the, what you're saying is that you, um, earlier that you are still planning for the phasing so that you're not sure how many students are gonna be moved out into the relocatables and for how long? So the, the, the current thought from uh, Principal Miller, and he can comment on it, uh, one of the things he has talked about doing is the group of students that go into the temporaries day one will stay in the temporaries for the full project. Uh, that way people aren't constantly moving back and forth. It actually uh, simplifies the logistics because you're not moving people in and out of the temporaries. And then as you start renovating the building, they start hopscotching down the building. Those students move out into the temporaries. That area is renovated. As that area is finished, the next area students move into the area that's just been completed. Uh, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, back to the substantial completion at the summer of 2020, at that point, the only work that you're worried about being completed is the last phase of the project because all the prior phases have been completed and occupied. Uh, 
so that, that's the plan with that. In terms of the other students, you know, we have a rough idea uh, of, of how it's going to flow. Uh, again, we're, we're going to have more dialogue with the school to make sure we have the absolute right plan. Uh, and, you know, what typically happens is, uh, and it happened at Hereford, the principal there was very flexible. We're doing it right now at Patapsco. Uh, you know, the contractor and the, the principal then start talking about subtle shifts and changes to the schedule, to the, to the phasing that has to be agreed by all parties. Uh, so the, the phasing becomes a bit of a living document. There's a guideline for everybody to bid, and it probably works out 95% of the time, but there's always a little bit of tweaking goes on if, you know, the principal develops concerns or something, a program changes. You know, one of the things we've had in these multi-year projects uh, faculty levels change from year to year. Uh, programs may change. So something that's happened, we're planning now, 18 months from now, might impact something that's done on the design documents. Can you speak to the um, issue at Hereford High School that related to the septic system where there was a problem with it at the, it, it was during the punch out year um, that then needed to be fixed? Uh, you're talking about referring to the... This project does not have septic system. This is on city sewer. So okay. A, but I, I, I can speak to a problem if you want me to. Well, but let's, let's focus on Lansdowne and not on historic issues at other places. That, that just have a relevant impact on issues that they don't plan for, not to any of their fault, but that things can happen during construction processes. We'll accept that. Do you want me you to answer? You could please answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there was sewer odor in the auditorium area of the building. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, it turned out after a lot of investigation, there was a pipe in a crawl space that wasn't part of the recent renovation that had been cut during some work that was done in 1991 or 1992 that the pipe had been left open. It had never been capped. And it took a while because it was a periodic con incident. It didn't happen every day. Oftentimes it happened around 3 o'clock when the stadium was being used. Uh, it turned out it was a pipe that went into a manhole outside the building. Uh, there was a blockage that was forcing sewage gas back into the building, and there was this one open pipe, and it took a long time to find it because it was in an area of the building that wasn't touched by the renovation, which was in a crawl space. All right. Other questions I about appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Mr. Yulefeld. Okay. Well, let me, um, some of the comments have been that um, the, the renovation uh, in this particular case would not have the extend, the same extended life, a so-called a 50-year building. Is there any reason after a renovation like this that, that building couldn't last another 50 years? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Let me ask you another question. Uh, a new building, a new, a new high school today is approximated about $130 million. If we spend $60 million now, it seems to me that we are solving all the problems, perhaps except one. And so in order to solve the problem of additional square footage for classroom space, we'd have to spend another $70 million. Now, I think Dr. Brown said that in, two, in 2023, we may start to see a decline in the school population. Now, it would seem to me to spend another $70 million to accommodate some additional classroom square footage is absolutely ridiculous uh, based on the fact that there's an anticipated reduction in, in the school enrollment. So I, I can't imagine why anybody would want to spend $70 million more for a few square feet of classroom space. That's a comment. Um, uh, would you call this an inadequate renovation? Quite the contrary. Thank you. Um, uh, and let me ask, maybe uh, the principal knows this answer. And at any one time, uh, how, how many students do we have in wheelchairs or crutches? Come up here. I'm just curious if you know at any one time, you mean the greatest number of kids who are in wheelchair or crutches who would have to access the elevators in a, in a very long distance. We don't get students that are in wheelchairs. If students are in wheelchairs and uh, they're in there permanently, that they are 
then assigned to another school that can handle the ADA issues. Crutches, depends on what season and what sports season. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, that's a daily thing and you know, we just, we work our way around it. So it's, it's not a major issue that uh, we have so many students that will have to get from one area to another that couldn't get to an elevator. And Ms. Yulvelner, I must uh, I just also need to say that students with disabilities are always provided accommodations for additional time, um, um, for transition sorry. time. So. Um, and I have one other question, and I, I'm not sure the answer, but I think there's a differentiation. There's a difference between settlement and movement, I understand. Can, can you tell me the difference between settlement of a, of a building and the movement of a building? Or are they really this one and the same? Settlement is movement, it's just a vertical movement. Horizontal movement would be horizontal. So there's, a settlement is a subset of movement. Uh, it's really what the cause of the movement is that's important. Is there, would you say there's been vertical movement in a building? There had been, yes. Okay. And what about, what about horizontal movement? We saw no evidence of horizontal movement. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Some Other questions? Mrs. Miller and then Mrs. Causey. Okay. Um, the functional life of a new building, I'm told, is about 50 years. So for, I believe that there's a formula for calculating functional life when it's a renovation. Isn't it the average of it's, you know, the year that it was originally built and the year of the renovation? I have to admit at this point, I, 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 know, that I know there's a formula. Uh, you know, the reality is when this building's renovated, the, the state picks a 40 year time period for their life cycle. Uh, you know, if you think about it here in 2017, you go back, we're talking about in the late 60s and 70s, you know, you now have buildings that are approaching 50 years. Uh, you know, yes, the new buildings are planned for 50, but there's no reason to expect this building isn't gonna last 50 years. It's a 50 year renovation. So I, I, it's one of the flaws in the life cycle analysis that one is gonna last less than other because a roof we put on a new building is gonna be the same roof as we put on an existing building. The elevator we put in is the same elevator. The mechanical system is the same mechanical equipment. The windows they've just replaced are the same windows. So in our mind, when you renovate to the degree which we're renovating this building, with the exception of the bones and the age they are, and they're good bones, you know, all these materials are gonna have the same life expectancy as the same materials that go in a new building because they're the same products. It's the same marker board, it's the same roofing, it's the same electrical wiring. So the formula is one thing, but common sense tells us that the reality is they're gonna last the same amount of time. Except that it's not a new building. It's got new parts. No, that, that's true. This and you know, as someone who lives in a house that was built in 1928 and has been renovated a couple times, it's still almost you know, 80 years or not close, getting close to 90 years old. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I had a question. In the renderings, you show the, uh, a new classroom, and on it there's boards and whiteboards and monitors and so forth. So what is the current projector plan for uh, Lansdowne High School? And the reason I ask is we had um, our staff had for several years um, explored projector projects or projector systems, and when we built Lions Mills Elementary School, they had used the, these um, Epson systems that seemed to work very well. But then the next new construction that was done at Catonsville Elementary School and uh, Westtown, and I believe Westchester, um, they went to a different projector system that was $6,000 per classroom as an estimate. Um, and that product did not seem to work. There, I have minutes from a PTA meeting where there were problems with that. Um, and now it seems with Relay Elementary School, we have a new projector system that's uh, Promethean boards on wheels. Um, so is there a plan for the projector system and what is the estimate cost? Because at 6,000 per classroom for Catonsville Elementary School, that's a, that's a pretty high cost per classroom. Uh, for fixtures and finishing. So I'm curious, is there a plan yet? And is that gonna come to the board? 
The, the plan is a part of the renovation. Techno the technology team in, con in consultation with CNI as well as the school administration will determine the best instructional needs for that school, whether it's... Um, um, can I shortcut that? That'll, that'll come to the board as part of the April 2018 contract approval process. That is That's correct. Very good. Because the box light pro projectors did That's not right. come back to us. So well, no. is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that this, all of these contracts are going to come to this board. That's great. Visible, not in a consortium large contract where we can't recognize what they are. Um, we'll make certain that, that the, um, the projector portion is flagged for you. All it's right. not flagged no, for me, flagged. Mr. It, Chair. We'll, no, we'll, make flagged that, we'll make certain that it is flagged. Of Baltimore County we'll Public Schools that to flagged, understand Mrs. that we're, are there any other that we're utilizing about, every dollar are there effectively are there any because other we questions? don't have any to waste. Are there any other Thank questions, you very much. Are there any other questions for the panel before we revisit Mrs. Uh, Miller's motion? All right, Mrs. Miller's motion, I believe, was to delay this renovation for one year. Let me go ahead and, and restate it. I move that the board directs BCPS to delay further progression on the Lansdowne renovation until February 2019 so as not to functionally preclude the possibility of a replacement building. All right. And so I, I understand that means that, that the effect would be to request that this renovation dollar amount be removed from the capital budget, which is going to the IAC next week. That's not part of my motion. That's, that's the functional effect, though, correct? I don't know. All right. Is, is there a second to her motion? All right. I'll second that motion. All right. All right. Uh, okay. I have a few comment? questions for Mr. Smith. So yeah. there's a motion and a second. Now discussion on the motion. I have discussion. Well, I'd, I'd like to ask you, what would that mean? I mean, we're delaying Capital for plan essentially is 13 already months. at IAC. It was approved by this board and it's there. We've right. already started the review process and sending the compulated document that is required. We've already received questions back about our submission now. So to change that, that restarts pieces and parts of that capital plan. So um, we, if, if, if the motion is to, is to delay it for a year, we're in essence, we're rescinding our request for that one project. But we've delayed other things that have been accepted on our requests. No, and we, we've got a time frame to, to begin, don't we? Isn't it a two year window? The, 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 I'll, I'll say it this way. The, the project when it came before was going to be with, was going to have a completion date of um, 2019. We went back and enhanced the renovation um, and pushed it out a year. If we make any modifications and take it off now, we run the risk of extending that project out another year. And so that's the best way I can say that. The, the capital plan is already at IEC. It's already under review now. We've already gotten questions back. To add, to take anything off now would mean that we would have to rescind that item at a, at a date that the board. Right, but what I'm getting at is we wouldn't have to take it off. We just You'd don't have to, have to act You'd upon to it, it correct? In order to make the substantial completion, we have to start working as soon as possible because if not, we run the jet, we run the risk of not being able to deliver the school when it's listed here. So we don't have the ability to wait a year to decide whether or not we're going to do it and then keep the same time schedule. So to be to clarify, the FY19 capital budget would remove lands down from that budget. That is correct. Okay. Any other comments, Mr. Stewart? You made them. No, you did second the motion, so I would be happy to defer to you at first. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll be after Mr. Stewart if that's okay. Very good, Mr. Well, Hayden. You're next. Be lengthy, so I'm sorry. Lengthy. Yeah, that's kind of my mo recently. Um, I'm afraid, but uh, let me just start here at the beginning. Um, I'm going to keep it as short as I can. Uh, you know, I think we kind of knew this was coming. Uh, this is the most important thing I think we'll consider for Lansdowne in more uh, than a generation. So I'm going to offer a few remarks and I hope you'll bear with me. Um, the importance of this decision is what kind of makes it remarkable to me that Ms. Miller, you wanted to kill the project before it arrived and now that's here you want to kill it at the first opportunity before we've had a chance to have a dialogue with the community about it. That's what John was talking about, talking it over to ensure that we had the right plan. 
And in fact, that's what our state comptroller was talking about, and that's what he was doing after the design was released. He was trying to have a dialogue, and I think that kind of effort is commendable. You know, eight months ago, we, we rejected the renovation that was proposed to us. We discussed it in full, we analyzed it in full, and we said it wasn't enough. We needed something more, because this building couldn't just survive for a few more years. We needed something life-changing. And so we directed our staff to go back to the drawing board and propose a new solution that would be, in the near term, something that's worthy of the long term and of Lansdowne. And so we asked for a renovation that wouldn't just meet the Pikesville standard, it would exceed it. And it would set a new standard for our entire county. A renovation that, as John was saying, would go down to the studs and ensure that this building has the look and feel of a new school. So I think that it is poor practice for us to reject this out of hand. I truly do. You know, this could be a potential solution, uh, but we need to discuss it with the community. I, th I think that that's clearly the next step. That's outlined. That's what we're going to do. That's what we should do. But as reasonable board members, we have to make decisions based on good faith and based on the facts. And so let's, let's get into it, because Ms. Miller, last night you stated, and I quote in your email to us, it is not the job of the Board of Ed to analyze whether the county has funds for needed projects. I don't understand that. I think it's misplaced to think that we operate in a vacuum, divorced of any concern as to fiscal reality. You know, if money was no object, there would be no need for renovations ever. We would only ever build new. But we are in a real world where we confront facts and make tough choices. Otherwise, why do we have a budget department? Why do we even receive a CAFR? Why do we have conversations with our funding partners? What are we doing here? And second, even if the, public, the Board of Public Works rejected this project, the county could still choose to fund it, but the county would still forward fund the share of state funding. It wouldn't be an entire county project, as it has done before. So it would seek to recoup that funding over time. That's been a misnomer that's out there in the community. Third, the state only gives us $40 million a year for school construction. So to think that it would give us $60 million or a maximum amount for a new school, which is about $80 million, is unlikely at best, especially when you have three other communities that need new schools based on enrollment, none of which, mind you, have actually been allocated any money whatsoever. And according to Mr. Quirk, that is quite unlikely for all three of them in the near future. Nevertheless, I did formally request that this level of commitment come from our state without success. Fourth, as far as life expectancy goes, public school construction program, I took a look at this today, projects that new schools will last 50 years. However, it treats schools that have undergone complete renovations as new after the complete renovation, meaning they have a similar life expectancy. So this renovation is not about adding a few more years to a building. That was the last renovation, and we rejected it. This one is so much more. So although there may be people who don't want to listen to anything that comes from our staff or our county about this project, about stability of subsurface, about the amount of money available, enrollment, or anything else, we have to try to make decisions based on the facts. So whatever the case may be, the fact is we've had multiple ge geotechnical studies done, and they've been honest. There have been issues. We're going to correct them. We've had multiple designs proposed. We've had multiple conversations with our, with our fiscal authorities. And to listen to none of that, board members, to give it no credence, simply because we don't like certain county officials, I don't think is acting in the best interest of our kids. So what happens, folks, if we reject this project? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the alternatives are, because I think there's a misguided belief that we can just reallocate the money to the design and construction of a new school, and it's wrong. Here's why. As we've discussed many times, we have several communities with pressing enrollment needs. That's Towson High, Northeast Area, and the Southeast. As you heard from Dr. Brown, the same cannot be said for Lansdowne. And that means, by dint of state law requiring seats for students, Lansdowne would be placed at the very back of the line for a new school. And we're not talking about a couple of years. We're talking in terms of decades. That point. Enough may have changed, including enrollment or the economy, to kick Lansdowne out of line and back to the drawing board for a renovation. And second, the county only has a limited number of dollars each year to spend. We know that. Yes, it's $307 million a year on capital construction, but only a third of that goes to schools. That's about the cost to build one new school. We have 113,000 students and 170 facilities to maintain and invest in, and even more facilities, as I just said, to build. 
it's going to be quite a while before we see 70, 80, 90 million dollars that could need to be devoted to a new Lansdowne High School. So let's be, let's be clear-eyed about this. That brings us to our third point, the budgetary reality for our funder, the county. For many years, we underinvested in our school system. We know that in our infrastructure. That's why this county has committed to spend over $1.3 billion on school construction. That's just to get out from behind the eight ball, though. And as you heard from Chairman Quirk tonight, the county has reallocated significant funding to schools. It's liberally exercised its bonding authority, and it's forward funded a huge portion of the state money. In fact, the beginning of next year, the county will have forward funded $230 million, not including this project. So even if we put all $40 million that we're getting per year towards that amount, it would still take six years for them to pay it back. And regardless of all of that, by 2022, our public resource advisory group says we will be over our debt service limit. And again, that is without this project. They're publicly available facts. We have them at our disposal. We should use them. And you've heard them from a reliable source who represents this area, mind you. And when you add in the increasing pressures of pension and long-term health care benefits, it's a simple conclusion, one made by our spending affordability committee. The next county executive and county council have some hard choices to make on spending and taxes. So the fact that we rejected a $30 billion re renovation at the time, and we have an opportunity for a renovation twice that size, all before we have to make decisions about belt tightening, that's something I think we should consider, truly. A couple more things. There's been an allegation that we don't invest in the Lansdowne community because it's not as affluent. That's wrong. You heard Councilman Quirk talk about it. Almost 40% of all our funding in the Southwest has gone towards Lansdowne or the immediately surrounding communities. That's not including 60 additional million dollars for this project. The second allegation is that Pikesville is not a good comparison. Yes, they did build certain additions to that school, but building new, as we know, can be more expensive. And despite that, we are still planning on spending more money, as was said tonight. That gives you a sense of the magnitude of the project at this school. We're doing things that we didn't do at Pikesville, like install new floors all throughout the school. So folks, how do we move forward? There are people who are well-intentioned advocates out there, like Jim Malia and Diana Bergman, I think who share honest concerns, and we're addressing most of them. And for others, we're gonna continue to share information and make it the best renovation we can. But thus far, any issues that have come up have yet to be show-stopping, at least to me. And I think it's these type of advocates, and Ms. Causey, you're right, that have gotten us to the $60 million renovation. But there are others who are not operating in good faith that would like to mislead and level personal attacks. Some are not even part of this community. So I ask that we as a board do two things. Let's make a decision tonight and in the future, hopefully, based on fact and if we've come to a point where we've tested everything, we've tested the opinions, let's try to find a way to trust at least some of what we are told. The second thing is this. Let's consider not only those advocates who have been vocal and devoted substantial time to advocacy, but the families who cannot do that. We have hundreds of families who send their kids to Lansdowne High. It's a total of 1,300 plus kids there. Some of these folks are truly working around the clock to make ends meet, and they're counting on us to make decisions on their behalves as well. All right, I'm wrapping up. If it's a perfect world, yes, we never have to do renovations. But that's not what we signed up for. We're not on the outside looking in. We will, what we say, what we do, will affect real lives. And the gravity of this decision is heightened by the fact that the community schools model is being, or trying to be, uh, unrolled for Lansdowne. It provides wraparound services. It's very exciting. It's a catalyst for hope and for change there in a place that hasn't always had it easy. But we need a modern facility like this to get it done. And we need to have a conversation. That's one that if you check your email inboxes, I did, that Mr. Zach of the Relay Improvement Association, I'm not sure if he's here, uh, said that we should do. So what we've, what we've heard tonight, it's been, I think, very promising. I think we need to have a discussion. But if this really has the look and feel of a new school, if it's airy and has natural light, it's going to be life changing. So I'll leave the final word, I really am wrapping up, to Mr. Ernie Bailey. He is a 38-year resident of Lansdowne, and he is the president of the Lansdowne Improvement Association. It has been around for more than 100 years. In an op-ed, I have it, I'll pass it out if you want it, he strongly encourages all of us, and I quote, to continue to work towards a much-needed renovation of Lansdowne High School so that construction may begin at the earliest possible date. He continues, quote, 
please disregard the squeaky wheels of a few who would rather see us receive no loaf when a $60 million half loaf is more than adequate. I think we'd be wise to consider that, but I'd also like to suggest, and I promised to Mr. Bailey, that we are working on something even greater than that. That's something that could be life-changing. So board members, please allow this to go forward so we can have a dialogue. Mr. Hayden. I think we, by saying uh, automatically that we really don't want something as nice for Lansdowne as a misnomer. What I think we're saying by doing what is suggested we do is we're saying that it's okay to do that because it's Lansdowne. You know, we'll, we'll put a sm smaller there. We'll have classrooms that aren't up to snuff size-wise. We'll have stairwells that aren't properly uh, installed even when we get done and I could go through all the other things that the gentleman here mentioned tonight in going through the building. Is it going to be better than what's there? Probably. But is it going to be the kind of building that we in Baltimore County are going to be proud of as a senior high school building uh, for our boys and girls? And to say that, well, we don't want to go ahead and spend the money on something that is uh, not quite uh, up to snuff. We want to, we want to get a full-blown building with all of what we believe is necessary to be in a building. We want that now rather than to say, uh, well, let's go ahead and take this because if we take this, guess what? We'll never get anything else in Lansdowne. We'll always be behind the eight ball size-wise down there. And, and I think to move in the direction that we're talking about moving is a big, big mistake. It's a mistake for Baltimore County. And it is up to the county fathers when we say we need money for whatever we need it for to make that decision. That's the way it's always been. To think that, well, we'll just make a deal with them here and we'll get this, even though we're not really happy with that, that that's such a big mistake. Is it the right thing for the boys and girls of Baltimore County? Is it what the boys and girls of Baltimore County need? Or is it something we're going to settle for? And I personally don't believe we should settle for anything other than what the boys and girls of Baltimore County and this school district needs. Mr. Young, then Mrs. Causey, then Mrs. Miller. Is it the right thing for the boys and girls of Baltimore County? So is the renovation at Pike at Patapsco the right thing for the boys and girls of Baltimore County? Is the renovation that's currently going that's going to be going on at um, Woodlawn the right thing for the boys and girls of Baltimore County? So you're, 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 you're phrasing it like that, but you have to look at what's going to happen with the project. As the gentleman said here, basically it amounts to they're gutting the whole building and putting everything new in. The structure is sound, according to them. If we We're reject, still if not meeting the size parameters of classrooms, we are, sure, sure. Right? We are. according according to what they said, um, 34 out of 38 are within the state range, which is for a class size of 20 to 25 students. We're meeting the building meets the class range. Would we like larger rooms for everybody? Sure. Is it a reality? You look at the map. If you move the school to the fields, depending on how big you build a school, you're still going to be near the pond. So is there a place on there where you could put it where it's not near the pond, where you don't have those concerns about it sinking into the pond? We don't know. But you can't just say, is this the right thing for the boys and girls? Mrs. Causey. You, you, you can't say anything else, but is this the right thing for the boys and girls of Baltimore County? Yes. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one thing that everyone can feel certain about is that there are people up here that truly care about Lansdowne High School, about all of the students, and we do have difficult decisions to make, and we are trying to, each of us, 
um, from the information we have, from what the stakeholders have voiced as their concerns, we are trying to understand what will be the best decision. Um, I appreciate the passion of my fellow board members. I certainly agree about the comments where we need to evaluate every dollar that is being spent because we have tremendous needs around the county, not just facilities. I got a call uh, last February about a high school. They needed $10,000 for their students to take advanced placement courses. We're trying to advance advanced placement courses. We're trying to make it equitable across the county. And the high school budget didn't have it, $10,000. For those students to have an opportunity to be one step closer to college, to be one step closer to um, understanding that they are college ready. OK, so there are tremendous needs. And those evaluations need to be done on every single thing that we purchase and spend money on in this county, including the devices coming up. That's hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming out. And I don't want to hear the conversation about operating and capital being separate, because it wasn't when, when Dr. Dance took $20 million out of operating and gave it to the county executive for central air conditioning. So every single dollar counts, and we need, as a board, to take this amount of passion, this amount of inspection and questioning, and make that happen under the operating budget that's going to be coming in front of us. I am not going to support Ms. Miller's motion, although I support, I, I understand her perspective of wanting to try and get the best for Lansdowne and having the time to do it. I think that Nick taking the um, input of the community and that our staff going out to the community with this presentation for them to understand and ha ask all their questions and get all their questions answered. Um, also with the um, interagency committee for school construction, they're going to be meeting and reviewing these documents and I would hope that they would give it an independent review and come back to us if they feel that there's concerns um, around investing this much money in a renovation rather than a uh, new school. Um, but I do appreciate all of the concerns that my fellow board members have. Um, and I just wanted to say that's why I'm not supporting Ann Miller's motion, because I don't want them to move to the bottom of the line. <clears throat> um, and that we you know, can give it some time to, to get sorted out and have Nick talk to the community and then hear back. Mrs. Miller, you have the last word, and then we'll call the, call the vote. Well, I'm, I'm not going to address the false assertions of motives that Mr. Stewart um, put out there, but he stated that this decision is being made based on testing everything or the facts, but the facts are that there were no studies done on the replacement option. It's been precluded from the discussion from the beginning. And the only fact that caused that was people telling us that the county was not going to fund a replacement. That if we didn't do a, a renovation, they weren't going to get anything. That was what stopped us from actually gathering all the facts. Um, more facts, if we look at the, the money, we have a, a fiduciary responsibility to make good sound financial decisions here, not only to address the needs of the school system, but to be using those dollars in the best way possible. So let's look at it again, and of course, these are estimates, but this renovation is going to cost $60 million or more. That's being forward funded by the county. We don't know if the state is going to agree to pay any of that. Um, where for 130 million, 70 million more, there could be a new school. And the state has at least expressed strong support for that option. Now, there's no commitment because we haven't made the request yet. I have. I'll write the letter. It's not a it. letter. You submit a request for funding. And this is okay. the that's how you make the, the, that's how the, you make the request. So, yeah. um, so that would be uh, 60 million, over 60 million that the state would fund. So that would leave about 70 million for the county to pay for a new school. So we're talking 
60 million or more for a reno, not including nickeling and diming after the fact, or 70 million of county expenditure for a new school. You know, that's worth a look. Okay. Um, and Mr. if we move forward, at this point, the next thing is bidding. Once we start moving forward, there is not going to be any going back. This is our last shot to actually put them in line. It's not putting them at the end of the line. It's putting them in line for a school. They're not in line for a replacement. Ms. Schaefer and then Mr. Yulefelder. So speaking as a student, a renovation does feel like a new school. Um, when my Pike School was completed, like completely re completed last year, it was my junior year, and walking in to like this huge new school as opposed to, um, I guess I'll backtrack for a little second. Um, they decided the renovation when I was in eighth grade, so I never saw the building as it was before. However, I spent the first two and a half years of my high school experience in the building as it was being renovated, in the learning cottages, in um, the classrooms where there was construction next door, but it wasn't really disruptive. But the feeling of going through that completed door as opposed to going into some makeshift entrance that they used for the first two years is a huge difference on what a classroom environment can, or a school environment can make on a student. That library center looks amazing. And I don't think I've ever been in the school library as much as I would have been if it wasn't redone. Because it, com it complements how I learn now as opposed to being this holder for books. I can do, I can practice my presentations in there for class. Um, we don't have computer labs anymore as you saw when I took um, I was able to take a few board members on tours last week and the week prior, and that was awesome. And I hope you guys had the chance to see how a renovation performs with the student body. Um, I think that it's it's so refreshing to be in a new school. The natural lighting, the lights are brighter, the walls aren't that weird shade of yellow anymore. They're actually white. And it's nice, and it makes you want to learn. It makes kids want to come back. Our cafeteria, it wasn't redone, but it felt like it was redone because that's what the renovation did for Pikesville. And Pikesville and Lansdowne, you can't compare the two in a sense, but you can compare how the renovation will make a student feel. It will make a student excited to come to school. It will make a student want to go into that library where if you said, go get a book, they'd be like, mm. But those, it looks really nice. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that a new school can also, a renovation can be in the same equivalent for a student's behavior or students, like you know, um, as this renovation as to a new school. Um, I believe, um, so we had a student council meeting last week and I showed these pictures to Stacy Carver who's a senior at Lansdowne and his jaw dropped. He was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And he was like, I wish I wasn't a senior because that's a school that students could be excited to go to. I think if you take away the monetary value and you see those pictures and you see Pikesville and you see the kids that are kind of smiling when they go to school at 7.30 in the morning, I think that's what we can do for Lansdowne as well. And we can achieve that with this limited renovation or the other renovation. Mr. Yulefelder. Um, first thing is <laughs> I, I, would, I would invite a couple of you out to Vegas because if you're going to bet on the come, you're going to be a big loser. Um, Trust me, and and we're, there are no guarantee. And if you can get me an unequivocal letter from the controller that we got 60 million for a new school without taking it away from any place else, I'd love to see it. Make the request. You'll never get it. No, I, he opened his mouth and said we'll have it. I, I read that. Well, I don't see the letter. But uh, as I said before, no one has on this board has said anything about what these men presented to us as being inadequate. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear you say, well, we don't have this or we don't have that. They've completed everything. The only thing that we don't have is additional classroom space. And for $70 million, I'll say it again, if you can tell me that we need additional classroom space for six years for $70 million, you want to talk about properly spending money? That's ludicrous to even think in that terms. 
I don't know how we can not go All ahead right. with it. This has been a topic worthy of the over two hours that we have discussed it. Um, it's time to call the motion for a vote. The motion uh, Mrs. Miller made and Mr. Hayden seconded is in effect to um, delay uh, progress on uh, the Lansdowne uh, renovation for a year. Correct? It's close. Okay. <laughs> All in favor of Mrs. Miller's motion, please raise your hand. All right, the motion fails for lack of votes. All right, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, we thank, uh, thank you all for your good work. Thank Rublin and Associates for the presentation. Um, next on our agenda is committee updates, but I'll entertain a motion to uh, forestall that until the next meeting. Moved. Mm -hmm. All right. Any, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Very good. Um, uh, schools are closed on Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. I wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you uh, back in school on Monday.